Welcome, Bastronauts. This is Teal's Bass Galaxy, an endless dimension of fishing legends and degenerates connecting through raw, real, in-person conversations and stories. No, this is not your average fishing podcast. There's no rules. There's no limits. Three, two, one, blast off. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. Teal's Bass Galaxy is now offering intergalactic merchandise. That's right. We got apparel now, baby. Check out our website. We got a variety of apparel. Hats, bucket hats, sweatshirts, t-shirts, you know. All, all the finest goods. So stop on our website, tealsbassgalaxy.com, click on the apparel tab, and start looking good, baby. It's been confirmed. Aliens from another planet have landed on Earth. Sources say there's been two confirmed landing points for these extraterrestrial beings, one being Japan, and also, unexpectedly, in Minnesota, at Waypoint Angler Supply a local tackle shop on Lake Minnetonka. With the ever-expanding universe, it's no surprise that there are other planets out there that also share our love for the sport of bass fishing. And to Earth's surprise, this latest visit came from extraterrestrial fishermen light years away and many innovations ahead when it comes to fishing equipment. Some hypothesize these beings came from the planet of Naboo matching up with Mayan folklore dating back thousands of years with fishing equipment ahead of their time. It has been confirmed they left things never seen before by an Earth-born bass. Waypoint Angler Supply is the premier space station in the Bass Galaxy and has tackle that could previously only be found in Japan or the planet of Naboo. The Waypoint ship is full, but we don't know when the astronauts from Naboo will be back. So hurry in to Waypoint Angler Supply today and stock up on that Area 51 Planet of Naboo JDM good good before your buddy is whooping that sweet ass of yours. Stop into their store on Lake Minnetonka or visit their website, waypointanglersupply.com. That's waypointanglersupply.com. Use the code GALAXY0124 to save 20% on your next tackle binge. The Bass Galaxy is also supported by Veselka Fishing and Customs, Supreme Lending, Dream Team, Lake Country Insurance Services, My Wedge Motor Support, Supreme Lure Company, just north of Memphis, barbecue and catering. Thank you. First ever tattoo podcast yeah in the galaxy also first ever podcast recording in the new intergalactic bass galaxy spaceship we are entering the bastroid belt astronauts and uh well though i haven't seen you since vietnam dude how the heck are you pretty good how about you it's been a minute good I brought it's been way too long. Dude, you are like, you, well, you skipped straight to Hollywood, dude. I heard you like, <laughs> you know, maybe like thinking about joining the Illuminati. Like, like we're, uh, no. shit's getting real. Not that real. You're an all-star. Crappie, no, not an all-star. You, you, <laughs> you're a crappie killer. I do like crappies. Dude. Yeah. It's fun. I You've enjoy been, it. How often do you get to crappie fish in the winter now since the Chronicles? Way too much. I get so sick of it. I just want to chase something else. Right on. It turned into a job now. (laughs) Well, I did think of you, and I did bring something that I feel is intergalactic finesse bass or... Big crappies. Yeah. Ooh. 
and you can kind of read the bag. Yeah. But I know you like you're like my tiny bait guy. Yeah, I do love it. You're like my tiny bait guy. So. Oh yeah. Have you seen that before? No. What is that? It is the Koiki Shrimp from Hide Up Baits. That's sick. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. That's friggin' dope. Yeah. I just turned Dane's mic down. Isn't it weird? I could turn it up. Oh! How, how does that feel, Waldron? And then I could turn it down. That's really good. <laughs> we could turn up the tattoo machine, or we could turn it down. That's oh. funny. You really want to hear him getting in? You just well, crank her up. I guess it's 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 really going to depend on the listener. Yeah. Right now, I got I got him turned down. I'll have to uh, apologize ahead of time for the annoying humming in the background, but this it's is like a, this a sound is a machine. Day, this is a day for Waldron, so <laughs> this is for you, buddy. Yeah, this is going to be good. Dude, there's a needle going into your arm right now. I know, right? Isn't it cool? Dude, it's wild. Uh huh. And it feels really good, too. It's kind of weird. But I was going to ask you about the. So, like, JDM has become super popular yeah. in Minnesota, right? Yeah. Or bleh, in bass fishing. Yeah. Dude, is there a JDM, like, sleeper crappie market? Because that's what Not I thought really. of with that these would be baits. Right up like, and you're going to Japan in two yeah. weeks. Yeah. So I'm like, dude. Yeah. So what's yeah. cool about these, I think it's elastomer. Oh, so it's that stretch plastic. Here, put one in your hand. Pretty sure it's stretchy. And I think... Oh, yeah. She's stretchy. Yeah, so I think that's going to give it real nice action. It's going to last forever, too. Yeah. I was thinking, like, drop shot or jig head. Little tiny jig head for crappies. But I, I think I would drop shot that, like, for smallies. Like, during, uh, like... Drop shot this for crappies. You totally could. You use bigger profile baits yeah. than that for crappies. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Dude, we were catching crappies on DT-10s and, and chatterbaits yeah. last year. Yeah. So, like... Dude, when they're hungry... Dude. They'll... It's just like a... How many one-pound bass or even quarter-pound bass, half-pound bass you catch on drop shots? Right. 100%. Yeah. Hundred percent. No, that's freaking sweet, and it's very unlike anything else that's out there. Is this uh, electric shag color? Kind of, yeah. It's well, what do they call it. It's like that that goby color from Kytec. And what's the Z-Man color with uh, green? Oh, pump? that's to um, me what the it deal. is. Deal. Yeah, is that... it's kind of like the deal. Yeah, yeah. But I've got I've got a pack of those and a pack of green pumpkin blue flake. But I figured you'd get a kick out of those. Oh yeah. And honestly, the one thing that we haven't really talked about on the podcast yet, Waldo, is bug hatches. Yeah. And I feel like you are a little more like in the know on bugs than anybody else I know. And being that there's a nice buzzing sound with this needle going into your arm right now, I yeah. think it's only fitting to talk about some buzzy, buzzy bugs, 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 you know? Yeah. And ice fishing, we're so hyper-focused on bugs. Totally, dude. And I think yeah. fish eat bugs. A lot. Yes. And you know the other thing about I mean, bugs? I've, I've kept and ate just about every fish species out there. There's always bugs in their stomachs. Always bugs. Even if there's also minnows, there's always bugs in their stomach. Really? <laughs> every single one. Because, like, if I have a smallmouth die in a live well, I'm not going to just throw it away and let it go to waste. You know, I feel like that's disrespectful a lot of times. So yep. I'll keep it, clean it. And then in the stomach, there's bugs. Bugs with the crayfish. And a lot of times, like, malax in the spring. Oh, yeah, God. here's that bait. A lot of times, malax in the spring, um, you open up the, like, if this is, like, pre-pre-spawn type, type stuff where you're, like, talking, like, 48, 52-degree water. Okay. Um, they haven't really grouped up and started, like, staging hard up shallow yet, but they're still in, like, their bigger schools on the transition. Yep. So, 
when you catch one, you bring it in, you look in their side of their mouth, there's all sorts of little worms inside their mouths. It's all blood worms. That's what they eat 90% of the winter is blood worms. So like, you know how sometimes you'll hear people talk about shad migration, you know, mm-hmm. bait fish movements. Yeah. What bass fishing podcast have you ever t- heard people talk about bugs? This is like Very super little. fascinating to me. Yeah. I'm dead ass serious. Yeah. What, Very little. What? Yeah, so they eat bugs in the winter, they eat bugs in the spring, yeah. and I think the only bug it's hatch anybody most, talks about yeah. is your mayfly hatch up yeah. there. Well, that's because it's the most visually obvious. Yes. yes. You can see it. So, okay. 90% of bug hatches you can't see. I have so many questions right now, but <laughs> one of them is, like, how many different bugs are like common for them to eat you mentioned i know malax you got blood there's there's thousands of bugs but like for bass the big thing is blood worms large and small or just more smallies we talking um large mouth you get like a lot of other types of bugs uh like dragonfly larva all sorts of different types of bugs for large mouse but for small mouse it's a lot of blood worms that's why like the easiest way to catch them is oftentimes using like panfish gear, like three, four millimeter tungstens and like one to two inch tapeworm, bloodworm style plastics. So, yeah, all winter long, that's how guys chase them and catch them. So, small they, easier time. Yeah, and I so agree. They still feed on it a lot of times, um, like early in the spring too, because not all the craws are out yet. They're still kind of buried away under the rocks, and it's sure. harder for them to get to them. Yep. So a lot of times, it's like blood worms are just readily available. And small mouths oftentimes winter on like rock to mud transitions. Yes, they do. And a lot of that's because those transitions also have the higher blood worm counts. So do these blood worms, right? So they're going to use softer bottom. Is it always near hard bottom? A lot of times. Yeah. Why are the blood worms near hard bottom? Um, I think it's the right bottom composition for them to actually like survive in. So they need a little bit of hard stuff because yeah. that okay. So I I think of that hard stuff as kind of like a heating block, right? Yeah. So those blood worms, when that rock warms yeah. up, they go. Because you, you know, always find they go bleed out on. Yeah, them. you always find them close to the hard to soft transition. They're in the soft, but they're close to that. Sure, sure. So, do they go like? Do they swim up and be like, "I'm a blood worm"? Yeah, really. Yeah, they'll swim up. Yeah. <laughs> they like float up when they release from. They're they're like in a little. That's crazy. Dude. They're like in little shoots or tubes. It kind of reminds me of like a really good shrimp hatchery or like a yeah. shrimp spot in the Dakotas yeah. where all of a sudden you dr- drill a hole and you'll see a lot of worms come out when you drill. Yeah. And plunge. You know. What yeah. I'm saying? You're like this is a really good spot yeah. for jumbo perch and walleyes. Yeah. And you don't see it a lot, like, you don't see them float up to the surface all the times, but uh, in the spring you can. But a well, lot of paint times... Paint me that like, picture a little bit, like, not well, to interrupt you, but... Have you ever been on Mille Lacs in the spring yep. and seen, like, 48, 52 degree water? Like, it's still yeah. really cold. Yeah. And I seen smallmouth bust. I didn't know they were smallmouth, but I've seen shit bust in that. Yeah. I thought they were maybe... The Cisco big, and the Tulipi. So one of my homies, Big Red. Yeah. You've met Big Red. Oh yeah. Yeah. Great dude. Great dude. Uh dude, him and I have caught him on top water in like 49, 50 degree water. Just dead sticking poppers. So continuing to paint the picture, fish yeah. bus, those they're, bloodworms go They're on the surface eating the bloodworms. What are the bloodworms on the surface doing? They just have floated up from the bottom. Probably something to do with the water turning back over a little bit and sure. warming up. Because, okay, I'm glad you brought that up because there's one, if there's one thing I know about bugs Mm -hmm. is they're not that strong, so they can't swim up a strong current, for example. And I would say that of the bait fish species that we've discussed, I would say they're the most vulnerable to moving water. Oh, easily. And, I mean, they're the most vulnerable, but they're also the most prevalent in the fisheries. Ah, so there's just a ton of them. That's why, like, like the whole month of May and June on Mille Lacs, and I'm sure it's also very common with other places that have small mouths and have a lot of soft bottom. So, like, probably even the Dakotas, there's, like, what, 
probably like seven or eight different bug hatches we see from like really small, tiny little flies to, you know, giant mayflies. There's tons of different ones. And so that's why I also think like different color hair jigs work really well out there. Sure. sure. Because different times of year, different bug hatches, they look differently. Huh. You've got like your Helgramites and mayflies and they're those larvae that are super dark brown, blackish. And then you've got like those slightly smaller, like damselfly types, or uh, they don't call them mayflies. Um, it's a different type of fly. Bay f- bayfly. 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 Yeah. And those are blonde, like tan. So almost I like hear an olive rappers ri- rhyming mayfly and bayfly. I don't know if I can in do one that. verse key freestyle that for me quick. No, oh, but, okay, so Helgramite, right? So yeah. there's some Helgramite baits being made right now. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm, you know, I'm on the Helgramite pattern right mm-hmm. now. You know, you know, we're catching them on the Helgies. That yeah. seems to be all they want to eat right now is the Helgies. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, we're, what the hell does a Helgramite do? Same as a mayfly? Like, same uh, as a bloodworm? Those are more current related. Oh, so Helgramites are a little stronger buck. They like yeah. it a little more. Yeah, they, they can crawl. swim. And no, they, they can, crawl. Oh, they they have a bunch of little legs on them, and they crawl all along the uh, the bottom and like creeks and streams and like any like rivers that have a substantial amount of current and rock. So they like moving water. They love moving water, and so can they move up it. Oh yeah, they'll just crawl along the rocks. They so, don't swim. They just crawl along the rocks, and then when they hatch, they crawl up a rock so they're out of the water, and then they hatch. They're, so they're, like the the alpha. Don't... they're like the oh, yeah. alpha. They're like the alpha of the I mean, if you bugs. if you actually hold one, they're fairly hard. They're oh. like armor plated almost. How big? How big will they get? They get like two and a half, two and three okay. quarters. Some people say that they've seen them way bigger than that. I, I and I'm not actively looking for them. I'm sure they have, but the ones I see a lot are like two and a half, two and three quarter inches. That's why I love micro baits. Mm. Everything's usually under three. Yeah, no. Yeah. You just described a Ned Rig. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I mean, you and I have had some fun days on Malax on a Ned Rig. We have, dude. Yeah. And tiny Even baits. the Ned Rig jig. You remember that? When they first came out with it? The dude, Z-Man Ned we, Rig jig it had the little wire keeper. I'll never forget sitting with you on one of the Miramars. Yeah. Uh, and we had, like, we eventually... Just rigged three or four spinning rods up each with yeah. Nedrigs because that's all we were getting bit on, and yeah. we we're sick of retying. Yeah, and yeah, it was the original Z-Man turd head. Yeah, with the original Z-Man turd. Yeah, and every light ass spinning rod we could throw it on, and we I remember and we were the drift deal drift fishing. We were drift fishing, but the idea you had to shake it on slack to get a bite. Yeah, you can move it and drift it, but it, I remember what we figured out that day was shaking it on slack and then they yeah. bite it and I just we were letting the motion of the boat carry you down the. I yep. mean, it was just a big flat that we were on. It was almost like a shelf off of the one of the shallow reefs. It was like a, well, I think it was like a twelve foot shelf that we were just fishing, drifting down it, mm. but we were throwing those micro baits. Dude, they discontinued my favorite micro bait. What 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 is that one? The Cabin Creek Itsy Bitsy Spider Parts. Oh, God, Dane liked that I one got too. Of them. Yeah, I have a ton of them too. I found one store. Actually, Big Red found the store, and he ordered like a thousand dollars worth for us. I've never it even caught insane. a zebra mussel on one of those, dude. <laughs> really? I don't catch them on it. I don't like how much resistance the yeah. flappers have for that. Yeah. For whatever reason. Yeah. Dane, on the other hand. I've seen him wax that ass on it. Oh, my goodness. Hello, Danny. I just want to hear up. Dane told me to come in and say hi. Hi, Danny. Hi. Danny, can you just come over here and say hi to everybody so people can actually <laughs> believe that Dane has a beautiful wife? Hi. <laughs> everybody now can... Just... Whatever, it's fine. <laughs> everybody now can say, James Chapman, you've done well. <laughs> nice work, James. <laughs> <laughs> hey, one of your horses is looking a little shaggy. Might need to trim that one later. Sorry, I didn't mean it. No, no, we can't. We can't give a horse a haircut on a podcast. Oh, that'd be kind of like this is maybe challenge number one. <laughs> Danny, do you think 
your horses are well trained <laughs> enough where we could run cords and like a centering station and record like a podcast on horses sometime. Oh yeah. They're well trained enough where we could keep like see this is a soundboard and then where the mics go into. Could we have like what's the sidecar? Can cor- horses carry like a sidecar? Okay. I mean, I'm sure you could rig something up. I think we should have a board meeting next Tuesday or Wednesday about that, if you're okay with that. Put it in the schedule. It's just good to see you. <laughs> good to see you guys. Good seeing you. You'll be here soon enough, Danny. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. We just appreciate your supportive, loving nature. Yeah. It means the world. We just have to remember that she probably builds more rods than I do. So. <laughs> she does have a place here in the galaxy. In the galaxy. <laughs> Honestly, she's she's like, she's the reason Veselka is where it's at right now, dude. I can't argue that. I can't argue against that. I mean, that's exactly that's exactly right. I know. So you're gonna we're gonna have her on one of these times, just so the world knows that you actually married somebody beautiful and smart, which. Yeah, you're going to have to do that. We weren't sure about you being able to pull that off. Some game. sort of proof. You're making me blush. <laughs> Danny, we're going to get back to our bass nerdery. Yeah, get after Thank you. Guys. We're going to oh, continue yeah. to talk about Helgramites, babe, if you want to. Yeah, we're, we're getting in deep about hear. the Helgramites and the zebra mussels and the. How you haven't ever caught a zebra mussel? Not on this lure. Not on this lure. No? Not one time. Because my football jig was standing upright. Okay. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, Danny. Bye, guys. Bye. Man. Danielle Volsalte. You, oh, dude, yeah. How does it feel to outkick your coverage every time you wake up? <laughs> I should probably reduce my life insurance policy so she doesn't off me and find somebody better. <laughs> 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 you know what? I do have to say a few things, though, in regards to these bugs. Because, Waldo, it's funny that you mention the amount of bugs that smallmouth eat. And I think a lot of people don't correlate that with walleye fishing either because oh, yeah. I've had multiple instances where the walleye bite through the ice on video is so much better with a bug profile bait as you can watch yeah. it sift through the mud. Oh yeah. And with smallmouth, that is such a huge thing for a good portion of the year, yeah. especially in the summer months. And people forget that it's not just a a bait profile like a bait fish profile that you can get really micro with it i think that's why like net rigs work all year round for them yes i would agree and i think there are a lot of different hooks and a lot of different weights and a lot of different lines that people yeah like to rig this type of stuff on Waldo, what is a what is a like common setup or approach for you if you're throwing some of these really light wire hooks or what kind of hooks you're even using like what are you looking for when you're trying to break down a a bite that's very bug oriented oh um that's a good question because i I mean a net rig is a pretty common yeah like start right i'm using like probably an eighth ounce and lighter for heads for sure because i i like slow falls that's your secret (laughs) a net rig no. It's been done before. Just oh, yeah, I'm well aware of that. <laughs> no, no, no. No, like, even 32nd ounce and 64th ounce heads, depending on the baits, just to, like, get crazy slow falls, and then, like, throwing it on an 8-foot, 7.5 to 8-foot medium light rod so I can really whip it out there. It's the same concept as a hair jig. Yep. The yep. whip can launch it. How light a line are you throwing for that little, t- like, light jigging? Because I definitely like feel like the lighter you go... Polymer. Okay, so you are Cole a Cole Palmer guy. Only for that, yeah. Why um, that? How come? Because it suspends. Oh, so, so you don't want the bait on the bottom. Well, I want it just to have a control fall to it. Got it, got and it. And I don't want it to float and stay too buoyant where I don't feel the bite as easily. Because it not Cole Palmer going to be more of a yeah, floating I think line it, versus fluorocarbon's going to bow? Well, it's fluorocarbon like coated monofilament. Got it. So it... it it's like a heavier mono. Yep. So it it doesn't float as easily. So it more so suspends. Yep. So I do the same thing on my hair jigs. Um, 
I was switching between a couple different types of fluoros because you've got like high end fluoro and low end fluoro and they they sink at different rates. The higher end stuff will well, it's the higher end, it's thinner diameter, yeah. so it cuts through the yeah. water easier. So it sinks fast. Correct. Yep. So I was screwing around with a bunch of different types of line, and uh, I just grabbed some six pound copolymer P line, and uh, dude, it it worked really well. Maybe turn the volume down on this just a little bit. Move that mic up. So. I did before till you talked because I just wanted to yeah. pick up your audio good, but I, I the think buzzing I'm, gets louder. I think if we move this mic up just a little bit, and then I can, when I'm really talking, I can sit up straight and work. I think then the mic. I feel bad for the listeners because it it is kind of a ring. That's what I. I'm almost thinking. I'm almost wondering if we shouldn't like let you fucking tat and then do the second half when you're done. Just in case audio is bad, because this is a badass conversation, dude. For sure. So it's up to you guys. I'll let you y'all make the call. At the end of the day, it's just I don't want to waste anybody's time. Yeah. As far as testing audio, we've done that from a testing standpoint, and I guess for Waldo's sake and for your sake, um, I want to make it a good show. Dude, yeah, I mean, because this is think. a fun conversation. For talking sure. Talking about bug, like when you told me Waldo was coming out here, I. I had the perfect, like, dude, yeah, it, it's in such mind. a, I love his yeah. perspective because yes. it's unique, it's different than, yeah, it's, it's exactly the what the galaxy needs. Yes. So it's just, I don't want to fuck it up because of that tattoo gun. I bet you, you could just turn my volume down just that, ever so slightly more. That's what more. I was doing. So and you then, were turned down, like, hurt near all the way for a lot of it. Yep. Like, how about? Now I can't hear you. Can you turn it up? Well, you're really close if you get it right about. That's pretty. Because you do want to be able to hear yeah. the tattooing. A little too, bit. Because yeah. and, cool. and I can talk like this. And if I really want to get clear and get when up here, talk, totally. As long as this there. is. Yeah. Perfect. That'll work. And I think having that mic up just a little bit higher really allows me to get down here and get the sound kind of out of the way a little bit more. You Love might even that. be able to run a filter and, and get that out of good chunks of it. Cole might be able to play with that. Yeah, and, and we'll make fill some it out. This isn't going to take hours. Yeah. So. We ain't worried. No. So, yeah, that actually sounds better already. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. This Cole polymer idea, you know, I talk about... How's graded... the diameter on it? It's my question. <laughs> well, Sorry yeah. to interrupt. It's, yeah, that... it's not as thin as you would like. Like, it's not like... It's not like Tatsu or any high-end fluorocarbons that are just crazy thin diameters, but... Because it's like, why wouldn't you use, like, the nice, the strongest, thinnest yeah. fluorocarbon to line, to me, yeah. is what I would do. Yeah. Or else, I mean, why wouldn't you just run, like, 8 or 10 fluoro, then? Because that I sounds like 6 lower. Because it... It, it's you, more you like the buoyancy, buoyancy of the line. Yeah. Got it. It causes me to slow down and fish slower. Sure. Because sure. a lot of times with fluorocarbon or like even a heavy bait, it just gets down so fast, I want to fish it fast. I get that. Like, because yep. I'm already on the bottom, I want to start moving it. Whereas, like, I really have to concentrate more on feeling the bait with the copolymer because it's not as sensitive. It doesn't have that bite transfer that fluorocarbon does. So. It causes me to slow down and really pay attention to, like, feeling the rock, gliding it over rocks. Um, so I, it just slows me down. That's the main reason why I use it. And I like the added buoyancy because it causes the bait to move slower, too. So I don't know. I just like it. Plus, with those light wire hooks, sometimes I want a little bit of stretch. I don't want to, like, mm -hmm. pop those small hooks out of a fish's mouth, yep. which can happen. Yeah, yeah. You so, want good drag, good uh, yeah, you good really, drag, probably light, medium, medium light to light action. Yeah, like eight, ten pound braid. I like eight a lot. I've been screwing around with eight a lot more. What braid do you like on that deal? Because i uh, I'm still, I'm not married to one, but I've heard about well, this Cortland, it, Cortland stuff that's supposed to be good. In like, I've never tried it. I'm four to six I'm pretty old variety. school with my power pro. Power pro. Uh, so, like, when I'm not fishing tournaments, I'll just run Power Pro because it's cheap and easy, and I don't care about replacing it because you can get it at Walmart for, like, 10 bucks sometimes, so <laughs> it works pretty well. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I was doing tournaments, 
and guiding, I was using Tatsu. Or not okay. Tatsu. Okay. The, uh, Do you trailer your big outboard? Then you need the My Wedge motor support. My Wedge keeps even the heaviest motors safe and secure on the trailer. And talk about easy. Up with the motor, on with the My Wedge, back down, ready to roll. And My Wedge is built to last. It won't rot, it won't split, it won't fail. Guaranteed. Pop on My Wedge centering clips for lateral stability, and you're good to go. My Wedge, security in a snap. To order yours, go to MyWedge.com. Are you ready to reel in your next home purchase or refinance? Supreme Lending's Dream Team can help guide you through the entire mortgage process, from pre-qualification to closing. They have a wide variety of home loan programs in their tackle box, including down payment assistance and first-time home buyer options. Just ask me. I trusted Aaron Dagus, a bass fisherman just like you and me, and Supreme Lending's Dream Team to help finance my first home. Contact Aaron Dagus and the Dream Team today by scanning the QR code or giving them a call at 763 763- 326-0677. That's 763-326-0677. Did I catch a seven in there? Or visit their website, aarondagus.supremelending.com. That's A-A-R-O-N-D-A-E-G-E-S dot supremelending.com. Uh, samurai. Daiwa Samurai. It's expensive, but it's super thin diameter, and it casts really well. Man, because that's a pretty soft braid. Yeah. I can whip. I can I can get a better you whip. Don't, you don't get any uh, wind knots with how if, soft it is? If I put too much line on the spool, I'll get wind knots. Got it. Got yeah. it. So it's almost like that softer line, you just can't load the spool as much? Yeah, you just can't have it... Um, the spool all the way full you you have to stop like a sixteenth of an inch short so it doesn't cast well it's weird because it still casts really well and i think a lot of that's to do with the long rod there's like, a lot of variables that go into play with yeah line coming off your yeah because like sure. if you have a longer rod you can probably make up for a little do you want me to go like that yep or, okay yep. Um, you can probably make up for a lot of the, uh, a lot of the resistance you added with the reel. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. It's kind of just about finding a balance of what casts the best and playing around with how full your spool is. It does win not though. If you have like too much, too much line or, uh, you fill the spool up too much. It just, yeah, it, it can be bad. Yeah. You're fighting with it. Mm. Yeah. You're, you're really funny, especially if it's gas and I'm relaxed. Or, or, yeah. Yeah, you might as well just put the rod down. Yeah, you're trying to throw this one eighth little bug imitating bait. Yeah. It's not going anywhere. No, yeah. So, like, let's take that smallmouth example that we're talking about, and let's go through, like, seasonal, like, what's the seasonal times where, you like, a bug bite's going to be better? We talked about that early springtime, 48 to 52, right, with the bloodworms. Yep. Okay. Even colder too, but Even that's colder. when I'm usually up there. So let's okay, let's start with winter. Okay, winter bugs. What are winter bugs doing versus those pre-spawn bugs we were talking about? Um, so like the bloodworms will be active like pretty much all day and night. Winter, uh, you have a lot more zooplankton and phytoplankton, and those are mostly nocturnal. But those are so small, it's you really have to have like Micro. tiny three, four mil jigs. And uh, a lot of glow plastics because they're nocturnal, so they're active at night. You can see them on your electronics, too. It's like a lot of little weak readings that fill up the water column from soft bottom. And it just gradually starts from the bottom and goes all the way to the surface as you get more into the night. Do so Those plankton, they eat those year-round, right? Yeah. Okay. Every fish eats them year-round. Right, yeah, yeah. right. And that is like when we talk about the circle of life. You know, it's that's where it uh, starts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the was, beginning. Was that a Lion King oh, yeah. reference? Yeah, Lion King it reference. totally was, wasn't it? That's a banya. <laughs> um, so interesting, very interesting. So yeah. the zooplankton basically, it's just more fish transition to eating zooplankton in the winter. Yeah, because they're easier to eat. They take less 
uh, metabolism to digest. Yeah. All of those things, right? Yeah. So okay. they just have to swim and open their mouth. And zooplankton are weaker than the other bugs we were talking about, so they really blow around. Yeah, and they, they don't blow move around more than the fast. bait that blows around. That if eats you them. drop an underwater camera at night and then turn the LEDs on, you can see them all. Whoa. Yeah. You can see, see them all, and there's hundreds and hundreds on your screen. Dane's seen it. Yeah, so it's wild. Yeah. The underwater camera my uncle has up on Sand Lake in that North Home area, that Black Duck area, I've seen him when I've caught... I, I talked about this with yeah. you and JP, yeah. catching those smallmouth, and yep. I had a, a tough time finding the walleyes, and then the smallmouth came through, and it was like those clouded areas. It's almost luminescent when you turn yeah. on the light. You're yeah. Like, what is all this debris? It all looks white. Like, and then you're like, why is that debris moving, moving randomly? Yes. And you're like, oh, that's plankton. Those you, are bugs. You kind of think of it like a whale and krill, like yeah. swimming around, and they're just like pods. Whale? And I speak whale. You... <laughs> okay, Dory. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that's a really good example, though, Dane, because it painted the picture beautifully for me. Yeah. Okay. So they eat the zooplankton, then they move up to the bloodworms, right? Okay. Yep. Now, after the bloodworm deal, now... Smallmouth, let's say they're thinking about making love. Yeah. You know, so then you have this spawn window where they get a little less buggy, and then there's like a fry deal after that. Yeah. After the spawn. And I don't consider fry those bugs, but uh, when is the next kind of, you know. Fairly, I mean, when does that's the next a cool bug thing. Deal go down? So while the spawn is going on, there could be six or seven different types of bug hatches happening on the lake, depending on the lake and the, where the water temperature is. Right. So there, cause I've seen like multiple times on lake, you go from one side to the other and you have really small bugs that are hatching on one side, little nymphs and stuff. And then the other side of the lake, like the annoying ones while you're fishing, like they're getting in your hood and stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. Those things suck. Yeah. Um, and then like other sides of the lake, the mayfly hatch is already starting. So, but there's, there's just so, so many different bug hatches that'll I, go on. I get that. Yeah. So, like, the blood worms yeah. seem to do the colder water, right? Yeah, that's first, that, usually. Yep. So then, like, mayflies, and they'll, mayflies. they'll eat them all year, because they'll dig them up out of soft for water sure. and stuff. For but, sure. like, they'll be floating sometimes in the spring. That seems early. to be when they're off the bottom, is yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. Yep. So then, after the blood worm deal, mm -hmm. does it seem to be... Flies, different yeah. types of yeah, flies. Yeah, a lot of flies. So that's where I, I, I really turn on my hair jig game a lot more. Yep. Um, but like, what early, water temp is the deal for that? Like, what ooh. when does that start in your opinion? Like, but it doesn't have to be three fifty four and up. Gotcha. Yep. You get a warm day, fifty three degree water. It's, they'll eat a hair. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. They'll I mean, eat a hair. And that's the other nice thing about small. They'll, they'll always eat a hair. Curious. A hair is always good. They'll eat a hair to eat a hair. Yeah. But we're talking about you the could bugs probably use it in mimicking, the winter and right? still catch them on it. Totally, but like when the bugs hatch, yeah. will they hatch? Is fifty three too cold? They'll eat a hair jig. Like I know they'll no, eat a hair some jig. start to hatch. Got it. Yeah, your majority of your bug hatch is gonna be in between like fifty eight and like sixty five though. They definitely seem that when they seem to get off bugs. Yeah. Where it's not a thing. Yeah. Is. Like late July yep. to mid fall. Yeah. To even late fall. That's when it's until they get winter. Bait and crawfish. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. But is is that because they're not hatching as much? And they've already mostly No, hatched? I just think that time of the year their metabolism is the fastest. Got it. So they want a bigger, more sustainable bait to eat. Sure, sure. So that would be my guess is that their metabolism is just faster, so they need to eat more. Got this it. is just bugs. Have you noticed uh, like a change in bugs based on weather, like sunny versus cloudy? Uh, uh, anything yeah. like that? Like, because I know, for example, shad will act differently based on sun and clouds. Smelt, yeah. for example, they're fucking vampires. Bugs to hatch need light. Got it. So it's the same exact thing. So like when it's like dark out, cloudy out, you don't see nearly as many bugs as you do when it's sunny out. Sure. 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 You don't see as you'll see, still see them hatching, but like when it's bright sunny out, you're <laughs> that hatch is way stronger. So like if you have like sunny, cloudy, sunny, cloudy, um, you'll notice that like those days stacked in a row, the days where it's sunny are gonna be 
not as much fun to be out on the water because there's so many bugs. <laughs> that makes sense. That yeah. makes sense. Okay. Interesting. So what I've noticed about bug hatches, uh, specifically Dane and I noticed this on Vermilion, mm -hmm. is that once they hatch, you'll almost have the wind take them. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it'll push them. And ball them up oh, certain yeah. places, just like yeah. it bait. would bait, yeah. except it does almost, like, it literally, they... It's like the forces of God, Noah parting yeah. the red, you know, parting the Red Sea, so to speak. They can't. Yeah. They they like we were almost fishing mayfly mats. Yeah. 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 And they're like near those. Uh huh. Dead mayfly mats. But oh yeah. Like there's still live ones that they'll pick off underneath it. Yeah. Do you have any yeah. little patterning hacks or like you know little things that you can do to like hack a bug bite? I well just being observant of the bugs and where you're finding higher amounts of them is the easiest thing to do. Whether it's on your electronics, your electronics might be more cluttered and grainy. Um, that could be just because there's more bugs, like going from one side of the lake to the other. Yep. So like if you're forward facing or even your 2D sonar has a lot more clutter and graininess to it than on a different spot. A lot of times it's, it's bug related. It's seeing more of that. It's like uh, if you go from fishing, like, let's say Minnetonka, and then you dump your boat in on the river, the river's going to look a lot more grainy on your sonar, and you have to adjust your sonar settings for it, and that's just because there's so much more crap in the water column. Right, that right. it's hitting. So just paying attention to that, and then obviously seeing visually the bugs, like those bug mats that you guys are fishing, or um, just paying attention to the color of the bugs that are hatching is super important, too. Yeah, yeah, because what, because that's, I guess, was what you made me think of is what are some things you keep in mind imitating bugs? You've got size, you've yep. got profile, you've got color, Color's you've my got one. movement and action. Yeah. Color is your number one, yeah. is just trying to match the color of that bug. So yeah. if it's a mayfly lighter, yeah. it's a blood worm. you freaking put a couple of drops of sacrifice yeah. blood on your lure before you cast it. Yeah. Yeah, the blood worms, I'm usually throwing straight red. You're straight bleeding on your baits yeah. before you go out that yeah. day. Yeah. I'll it. dunk the whole thing in JJ's magic red. <laughs> yeah. I'll dunk the whole dang thing. <laughs> I do think that there's something to note when you're fishing with such a light bait and you're trying to match the hatch, if you will. Mm -hmm. The line diameter and the depth in which you're fishing yeah. and the cadence in which you're fishing yeah. can really, I mean, if it's super calm or yep. if there's a little breeze, I've noticed that if you can fine tune your line diameter from six yeah. or five to yeah. seven, eight yeah. or 10, depending on where you want that bug to be and how fast you're retrieving yep. it or how you're towing it, because a lot of times these yeah. applications isn't much of a reel. Yeah. You, towing it's my favorite thing to do. Yeah. And if you, if you can dial in a weight yeah. and be kind of adventurous at first yeah. and really focus on, okay, where are these fish located? Where are they suspended? A yeah. lot of people are afraid to throw a fly in deeper tannic water. Yeah. It's okay to fish a fly deeper than eight, 10, 12 feet of water, especially if these fish are suspended and people forget yeah. that part where you see a pattern and you see, you can see bugs. You can tow this hair at a certain distance and without reeling it, almost use the wind to your advantage and just yeah. let the bow in your line pull that hair along. Yeah. You'll catch a lot more yeah. fish when you realize that not reeling or fishing with a slightly heavier hair in deeper water mm -hmm. can be way more productive than fishing on the edge of a rock flat yeah. or in a transition. I do. I, so, I agree with same that. Same exact so, thing. So what kind of line diameters and ratings are you using? Is there a parameter that you have with your with your tippet or your tagline or your leader that you're yeah. going like up to 12 and no more than 12 or have you ever thrown hair jigs I on like six or eight and never 10 never tried with like a no, little bit bigger no you can adjust that with weight right yes. yeah. so if yet so you can either do constant one of two ways right yeah. you can keep a constant weight and adjust your line yep or you can keep a constant line and adjust your weight it's yeah. definitely to me easier to adjust your weight than it is to tie yeah. a new leader yeah however I guess I definitely understand the point you're making, and I think there's a lot of ways to skin that cat. Like, yeah. for example, 
I think there's a lot of people that don't throw a 16th ounce hair jig just because it's harder to cast. Yeah. Yet, to me, if there's the a right time setup. of year where a 16th ounce will wax the sweet ass oh, of yeah. a third of a 332nd just because of that hang time. Now, yep. I'm using a constant mm -hmm. line diameter, and yeah. I'm adjusting my hair jig weight. Yep. There's another little trick Dane knows that I do to allow myself to have an eighth fish slower or more buoyant or hang better Yeah, that I can hang like a 16th but deeper mm -hmm. in 8 to 10 yeah. down kind of in that bottom three quarters down the yeah. water column where they're on the bottom feeding up just not as far. Yeah, The only thing I haven't messed with is topwater flies. And to me, there's a lot of that. They're hard to cast. Right, but we yeah. have these things called hair jig rods made by Vasoka Fishing and Customs now. Yes. And you have these buoyant Elastec products. You've got all kinds of different stuff. And yeah. I'm just wondering, have you ever messed with that? And is that something that's kind of untapped? Because I've got a few little buggy little topwater baits mm -hmm. that I was thinking for some eddies and some slackwater current stuff. And also, calm. You know the hardest days I'm yeah. a lax. Oh, the flat calm, calm where you yeah. can see 33 pounds and catch two that's when they eat the bugs the best <laughs> right and that's to yeah. me where you could even bomb a top water bug out mm -hmm. and feed line and get further yeah, away i haven't tried it i'm and sure it'll twitch work. it around and have them just yeah. because no one's doing it yeah all of a sudden they're coming up on the tiniest top water day oh i'm seen. sure that'll work you know i don't know i don't know I think I think it'll work really well, actually. You know what I just realized? Mm. I fished the NABC on the Lax with both of you. Yeah. And I got second with Matt Waldron. We lost by an ounce, an, an ounce or two. Yeah. To shame. And Dane and I won that following year. Yeah. But you remember that? That oh, was yeah. a that was a crazy. That day, was a micro bait fight. Yeah. It was yeah. so. We, that I, that was like my first tournament off my accident. Remember? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Because I was. Yeah, so we were we were taking her. 2017. Yeah, we were taking her easy. We weren't yeah. pushing her. So it's July or August of 2017. Yeah. yeah. And I broke all that shit in my back in May. Yeah. So I hadn't fished for a couple months. Yeah. And I think I practiced two, three days. Well, for I that took you I out in the boat on horseshoe. Oh yeah, remember that? Yeah. And I got queasy. Yeah, and you're like, yeah, we need to stop. So I went and dropped you off again. Yeah. And then, so we were we were concerned about Mille Lacs too, because if it's rolling out there. So. I I was letting her buck in the morning. Oh, you were, you were, you were gassing her. You were hyped. You forgot about every injury. <laughs> you were like, it's time to go. Dude, I, I mean, you put me on my parents' Dude, couch. Dude, you had that 22 TRX pinned. You I were, did. <laughs> you were ripping that thing. Well, I thought we were going to blast them on our starting spot, and we didn't, which yeah. that spot is totally that way, where yeah. it's like one day, I think I figured out, I'm, I'm starting to learn more, I'm, I'm, yeah. I feel like I think about that lake better than I ever have, but yeah. I remember we had a, we fished four corners of that lake per near, yep. and uh, I think the most frustrating thing was we weighed a three and three quarter. Yeah. And I lost a four giant. bass that day. Yeah. And uh, we saw one of them, and it, well, let's just say we know it was bigger than three and three quarter. I ain't going to say that. But I feel bad that I. That one was. We a had. Pig. We could have won that thing, bro. And, and yeah. I mechanically screwed the pooch on that. No, you did not. Dude, I did. You always have to factor in fish jumping off, especially with smallmouth. It's just going to happen. As Tuma would say, you have to get back to the lake deal well you okay. have to give back no yep. but the fish i lost have to give the back. fish i lost were boulder fish that were on a fly and the hook was too small dane oh i remember that that's what happened okay and daddy didn't set his drake drag right because daddy's back I think, was broken I, I think it was the yeah the drag I think was the. But remember, I said I got big bites on these boulders, and we'd fish them for twenty minutes. And I'm like, I got well, one. it was a boulder. Uh, yeah, sneaky one. Yeah, it was a boulder, completely away 
It was probably 300 yards away from an actual rock flat. Yeah. Just a random boulder, sand bottom, nothing crazy. Big and and we, we idled over it, and there's just one giant arc sitting on it. <laughs> and we fished it for like 10 or 12 minutes, couldn't get it to bite, and then you whipped out that was drop shot fly deal here it comes again not 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 the same one different no yeah yeah Yeah. and immediately fish like noses down eats (laughs) and then i proceed that was before forward facing too that was with 2d sonar oh yeah yeah so we were like dang near on top of it and you're like i'm pretty sure it's looking at it right now it was when boulders were hard and painful to fish (laughs) yeah yeah they used to be that way believe it or not kids yeah yeah, Dane and, was always really good at that. Yeah, you're just sitting there hoping your cast gets online. Right, right, right. It's like, <laughs> you you cast then, like 30 times trying to hit one spot, and then you finally hit it. Well, after five or six, you're like, am I doing this right? Yeah. That was the problem then. Now yeah. you just scope it quick. You yep, just there scope it. it. Oh, got it. Yep, my bait's going one after cast right. it. Yep, yeah. But it's falling on the right side. You remember that spot we made hay in the afternoon on, though, right? Oh, yeah. That was your little juice hole from the year before. Yeah, that... I found that on accident, and what's crazy is I caught big fish and champs to off that spot for the championship. Yeah. And I lost one bigger than that, the cast before, but I think we only lost one on that spot. But do you mm. remember them high schools? Do you remember why our school shut off that day? Oh, yeah, that was frustrating. Do you remember what the, that what was happening? We, were, we had two high school boats trying to get on our... Tiny ass yeah, spot. Well, yeah, because circling us, dude. So the spot was really close to a very popular reef. And it was completely not super close, but within with I mean within trolling motor distance. You couldn't boat. cast to the reef. No, you couldn't it cast would be to the cast to the Well, this rock spine's the size of two boats. Yeah. It's, it's, tiny. A, it's a tiny, it's a beautiful Yeah, But beautiful it was thing. probably five cast lengths away from that reef. So you would physically have to trolling motor over to us. Yeah, and, these and that's guys, what happened. You guys fishing. fucking saw us grab the net, yeah. hooting and hollering. Like, yeah. we, we, just we, were blasted, hyped. we just blasted 20, we had 24 a, pounds. We had bang, 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 bang. After I was so sad because I thought I fucked the pooch all day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was pretty bad. Well, <laughs> and Dave, you know, you know how defense works, right? When yeah. people start coming close, now I'm pulling the boat away from the spot, away from the school. Well, we shifted those position. Boats. Yes, and we so did. we changed our cast angle, and I think that completely screwed it up. Because we even tried getting back to that cast angle, but the fish shut down at that point, I think. These frickin' jabronis. They made it wasn't like there thing. was a lot of fish there, though. No, no. There was and like 10, 12 fish there. It was like you. we caught seven or eight of them, and there yeah. was probably four left to be caught. And, and they kind of scattered yeah. and spread out. Yeah. And then we had... Can you imagine? Jack Sparrow spoke? and freaking the yeah whatever the Mayflower yeah. freaking absolutely pillaging and pirating. I remember everything. the boat. It was a it was a White Ranger, dude. <laughs> it was a White Ranger. <laughs> there was two kids in that boat, and I was just like, dude, yeah. What you're teaching those kids right now, sir? Yeah, is the absolute epitome of fuckboy when it comes to bass fishing. Yeah, fuck you. Yeah, we uh, we call them bino fishermen in the winter for ice fishing tournaments. They're the guys that just whip up the binos and look for hook sets. Dude. It happens a lot in tournament ice fishing. How can a man live like that? Or the scope whores. How can the you guys sleep at night? The guys that will literally like follow you, because all you have to do a lot of times for these ice fishing derbies is just drop the scope down and spin it. They're like the like, seagulls from Finding Nemo. Yeah. Mine? Yeah. Mine? And so they just... Drop in the same hole, scope, drop waypoint, go on to the next one during pre-fish. They don't even sample fish anymore because you just use the, the forward facing unless the fish are in weeds. It's it's stupid, but yes, it's the same thing. We call them scope oars. You know what? I shouldn't even be mad because we were there first and we fucked them up and we found it and it was we ours. Did. And it was it was sweet. If we, yeah, doesn't matter because yeah. those and that's what those kids of that father. Yeah. aren't going to learn is no. when you do it that way mm-hmm. you're behind yeah you you're, are you're licking the sloppy seconds asshole of somebody yeah and usually it, especially with like a lot of guys that fish nabc's and classic bass events 
you're not you're not gonna get much after those guys clean house on the spot. That's just <laughs> it. It's like yeah, if you want to do good in tournaments, being the first one there and the first one to figure it out's the the Deal. way to do it. Yeah. So. No, that's the way you have to do it. Yeah, it was. That was a fun tournament, and was we were drop shotting baby tubes at the time, which I haven't yeah. been able to make happen out there since. Have you? Ah, uh, but I, I haven't, haven't tried it, it as much. I haven't fished it in the summer. I mean, now like floating jigs, towing jigs. I can't remember. There's a new term for it now. Um, hover strolling. Hover strolling. That's what it is. Mid strolling. Yeah. Strolling, strolling a bait now with forward facing is just so much more fun. That Stop I think talking. a lot of that stuff gets, I think a lot of it just gets, like forgotten about. Back but, to bugs. Yeah, there's something, <laughs> there's something to be said about drop shot in a baby tube. I mean, that's a lot of the micro baits I throw are micro craw imitators. The baby crawfish, the small crawfish, a smallmouth will never pass up on it. Because shells are so much softer. That's why that spider grub is from Cabot yeah. Creek is such a juicy is the little deal. thing, and dude. It's bulky. Yeah. You can put like a sixteenth ounce slow head fall. on it, and it just yeah. Hey. Oh yeah. Slow fall. But. But. Dane probably has been too busy tattooing and being a good American father to see the underwater video that Waypoint put out of this. That thing is nasty. Right here. That when you say nasty. little craw, dude. When I saw that, this, I was like, the oh, water. I'm going to buy a bunch for this spring. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Like, natural male enhancement, this crawfish <laughs> is the equivalent of a bass fisherman Viagra. Like, yeah. I went from six to midnight real quick uh, when I saw that underwater video. Oh, yeah. Um, How would you rig this, though? This is the Danny. It's, dude, this, like, sneaky Japanese craw. Uh... It's called the... Uh, I think I C I S S E I, and it's called the Danny. Dane, it's called the Danny. I'd split shot rig or multi rig. <laughs> it really it. It's called the Danny. <laughs> that is funny. Danny. The Danny. You would split shot rig that. Yeah, or I was mojo, rig mojo. It. Yeah. Okay. I love a finesse mojo rig. I was thinking on just a jig head or yeah. a finesse football jig. Yeah. And what you said. Yeah. Also, I feel like on a drop shot, it could be... It'd be really good on a drop kinda shot. Kind of cool on a drop yeah, shot. That could replace a baby tube in some circumstances on a drop shot. Honestly, the claws float, and, and it's got the most... Cool, it's just weird. It's a cool-looking yeah. bait. I want to show it to him in the... i I, I, I got to remember to pull that video up when we're done, because it... We need, a, we need a fish tank in here. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> Okay, while we're on the bug train, Almost though... Almost like a see-through live wall. Yes. Yes. Waldo, I have a lot of respect for you because you're one of the few American men that I've met who have won, even if it's a league night derby, won a largemouth tournament on a bug pattern. We're not going to say the lake. We're not even going to talk about the spot because I want to dig into this a little bit. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah. That secret little bug spot you found uh -huh. on that one lake yeah. for largemouth. Uh-huh. So we just talked about smallmouth bug stuff, bug, you know, transitions, movements, the migratory nature mm -hmm. of the wind pushing the bugs. Um, largemouth, though. That was a bloodworm spot, too. Largemouth eat bugs, <laughs> and, and a largemouth can eat a baker's dozen mayflies in one suction through oh, the yeah. old gillies. Oh, yeah. Right? And and do it multiple times in a row and then be just plumb full. So, one thing that I'm curious about is most people think that largemouth eat bluegills, crayfish, mm -hmm. perch, shiners yeah. in the summer. What do bluegills, perch, crayfish, shiners eat? Zooplankton? Bugs. Bugs. Yeah. Zooplankton. Yep. Um, some bluegills will eat zebra mussels. They'll so crack them. Eat the muscle out the oh, inside. Yeah. yeah, that's a big thing. Um, a lot of leeches. Pistachios, the yeah. underwater pistachio. What? A lot of leeches. Leeches. A lot of leeches. We're gonna get into leeches. Soft and silt bottom. Why do bat? Why does a largemouth? When the bluegills are there eating the bugs. Yeah. The crappies are there eating the bugs. Yeah. The perch are there eating the bugs. Yeah. The shiners are there eating the bugs. Yeah. 
why isn't the bass just eating those? Mm -hmm. And why does the bass eat the bugs? And does the oh, bass so ever easy. beat? Does the bass ever prefer yeah. bugs over those things? Ah. To the point where it will get to the bug spot before those things to eat yeah. the bugs. I think it's just about the time of year. Okay. And if if it's middle of summer, that's when I was having those tournaments. There were some that did have bluegills and stuff in them too. Supreme Lurico introduces a revolution in bass fishing with our triumphant trio. The Supreme Slug, Lil Slug, and Slaw. Leading the charge is the Supreme Slug. A legend revived after two decades, its unique shape and built-in hook slot redefined tactical brilliance on the water, giving you an edge like never before. But the saga continues with the Lil Slug, a miniature powerhouse that mirrors the majesty of the Supreme Slug. Don't let its size fool you, it packs the punch needed to lure in those elusive bass. And for the ultimate bass feast, there's the Slaw. A craw representation with the same irresistible characteristics as the Supreme Slug. It's bass seduction at its finest, designed to trigger predatory instincts. Exclusively crafted for bass enthusiasts, Supreme Lurico brings you a trio that's not just baits, they're bass magnets. Supreme Lurico. Cast in gold, real in glory. But the situations them, didn't? There wasn't bluegills there? Those no, there was, you won? there was bluegills there. Okay. And so a couple of them did have bluegills in their gut as well. Got it. But there was a lot of bugs. There was, I mean, my live well was covered in just black crappy, soft, broken down bugs. So do you think that the bass ate the bluegill, the bluegill puked the bugs into the bass, and then the bass <laughs> puked the bugs and the bluegill out into your live well? I have no idea. Is it possible? It possible? <laughs> and are aliens real? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they are. Government has actually confirmed it. But you can't believe the government. So yeah, still I don't know. Say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I don't know how the process works, but they uh, they definitely do eat a lot of bugs while i mean or a lot of the bluegills and stuff while they're eating bugs as well i'll find both in their stomach so i think like the middle of summer they're just opportunistic so if they have the easy amount of bugs to eat they're going to eat bugs and then if a, a injured bluegill or a uh, distressed bluegill comes by they're probably going to eat that too got it so how do you how does one go about finding a bug spot in the summer like in this large amount of situation um, like what like we're not saying the lake. We're not saying, but what does it look like? What does it look like? On the forward facing, it looks like um, a cloud that is is very hard to see. It's a very weak return, um, and it, it just it's gonna look like it's darker. It depends on your color palette, but it look it's gonna just look like there's a cloud of something there. With bait fish, a lot of times you can see more individual targets flickering. Yep. This just looks like a random cloud. Um, the same thing on 2D sonar. There'll be like a fuzz along the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, a fuzz is a great way. It just looks fuzzy on the screen. Those are bugs. Dude, that, that is so cool. Yeah. So now you're at, you found, okay. So you're basically looking for. And you'll find a lot of bluegill pods around it too. So you're looking for where like the Boston Tea Party spilt their sugar. Yeah. When you're looking for a bug spot. Yeah. A lot of do-nothing banks have them, too. That's a nice thing because typically you have softer bottom closer to the bank because there's no point or hump. So this almost, like, takes the map out of the equation or, like, structures. Like, yeah. So some of those, like, random ass, yeah. like, banks that look like junk. Inside turn could... banks are huge. For God. That. Yeah. That's what Is I think. Is that because ca they catch wind and zoom uh, well, inside turns typically don't have as much hard bottom, and the softer bottom cuts in closer to shore. Yeah, yeah. And so inside turns, those areas of soft bottom, that's where a lot of bugs are going to be. Whereas, like... A in, point. Yeah, a point, it's hard. harder bottom. There's not as... You'll have bugs there. It's just different types of bugs, but you don't have, like, the blood worms and stuff. Does it seem like... So an inside turn, when I think of that, I think of a drop-off, right? Yeah. So are they typically on the outside of that inside turn or like on the on the break like, and up on top? Um I like shelves on inside turns. So like if I have an area where the contours separate more, I'll consider that like a shelf or a bench. Okay. 
for them to to kind of chill on. Sure, um, sure. Those benches and shelves are a lot of times where the bugs are as well. So, like, I don't like a steady incline. Um, I like an incline that has something to break it up. So, like, uh, like a little shelf almost. Mm. Something for it to stage bugs and bait on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because, like, a steady incline, it, it's hard to tell where exactly you're going to be. But, like, let's say, like, on that spot, for instance, it's... Um, it goes from 12 to shore, but at like five or six foot, there's like a 20 foot wide shelf where it stays at that depth and then it gets shallower towards shore again. And that little shelf is where those bugs always have been. Have you noticed where like once you figure out a depth zone that the bugs are in Mm -hmm. that you can duplicate it based on depth and like, let's say, okay, inside terms, yes, but then it's like. Okay, twelve yeah. feet inside turn. Can you then duplicate it, or does I have a it hard seem to be some bugs. nuance to it? Yeah, I have a hard time with the bugs. It's very random. Got you'll it. you'll have a hundred spots that look the same, and ten of them will have bugs. Do you think it's because the composition, other position? Do you think, think it's because they thing. ate all all the bugs on the other spots already? I mean, they could, or they haven't hatched, or there's there. How many bugs you got to eat to equal one bluegill? <laughs> I know a lot. As far of as bugs. like <laughs> a <lot> protein, <laughs> a lot of bugs. So, yeah. I think it's just very random. Because, like, there's, even in basins while we're chasing panfish, there's portions of the basin that have bugs, and then there's portions of the basin that don't, and then it switches halfway through the winter. Like, it's all weird timing things. So, it's just more so being able to pay attention and see that, okay, there are bugs here. That's a good sign, at least. So, when you have noticed those bug bites, right? When Mm -hmm. you found that bite. And you're catching largemouth. Have you had to throw a bug bait to know, and that that was how you got them to bite, or could you yeah. catch them on other things? Um, for whatever reason, a lot of times, like crankbaits, I'll catch. Like, I'll for I don't know why, but on a lot of those spots that I'm catching them on bug style baits, I'll also catch them on a crank. Reaction. And I think it's a reaction of a bait fish eating the bugs or something that they think is going on, and then they eat the bait fish. But yeah. it's weird how it kind of goes hand in hand. But off, often I'm just cycling baits, and I like a lot of bug baits. I don't know why. It's just one of my confidence things. Everyone's got their own thing. Like uh, some guys are flipping is their deal, and that's what they live and die by. Other guys are more finessey and, and like to tinker around with a lot of little baits. And I that's my style. I like doing that. I'm a big spinning reel guy. I like having drag scream and well, you are the crappie killer, <laughs> killer, crappie killer. <laughs> yeah, I I just like finesse style of fishing, and being able to use electronics and stuff too is also a lot of fun with it. Yeah, dude. And now is where we get to really explore like uncharted territories in the galaxy because these basin fish you target. Yeah these bays and fish and i guess where my head goes as a bass fisherman is i feel like bass probably typically don't go out to the basin to eat bugs but if their food does i wonder how much suspended mm-hmm. bass go out to the basin to stage near crappies yeah. suspended staging to eat bugs it's I a food chain right? a lot of times like Ask, Those are untargeted ask Zona. fish. Basin fish are probably my favorite fish to fish for. Because they're always dumb. Because nobody fishes for them. I mean, a lot of times... Do we need a cut, or is this good? Are we good? No, I think it's juice. I think people need to understand that there are a lot more applications yeah. and approaches it, to bass fishing than... A whole new world. <laughs> the basin thing is so much fun. That's like probably one of my favorite ways to fish now. Dude, I don't do it besides smallies. And it's what you have me curious about is when I do do it for... Highly like, pressured lakes. It, it, and largemouth, yeah. it's near structure. Yeah. Like, But... What, I actually have when not does tried this happen? smallmouth fishing. When does this happen? Why does it happen? And and like that's this is a really fun and well, cool you know, adventure we're on like right now. Tackle Terry Tuma always says. Yeah, Tackle Terry Tuma. Tackle Terry Tuma. If they're not deep, they're shallow. If they're not shallow, they're deep. They're not either of those or somewhere in between. Yep. Yeah. So, 
Or they're both. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, 90, 90% of the baths, they live in 10% of the lake. Oh, okay? That's a, a linder coal right there. Well, I learned it at a young age. We're throwing ripping wraps today. Oh, yeah. This is this is slightly after the jigging wrap. Yeah, so they're, uh, the basin deal is fun. Um, you know, it can be that they are actually just um, chasing bait that's there for the bugs. I catch them on bug stuff all the time too, so I'm I'm sure they're eating bugs as well. I don't know if they necessarily go there for it, but it, it, you have a food chain, right? Yeah, in bugs. a lot of spots, like it's weird. Like if you fish, even on like all the little lakes around here too, it's the same exact way where you pull up to like a rock pile, like and there's three on the lakes. They're like, oh, they're gonna be shit stacked on one of them, and you're not catching a dang thing. You're like, what the hell is going on? So then you go fish docks, or then you go fish, ah, then you go fish pads. Nobody goes to the basin, and we always look at inside turns of basins. That's where we find panfish and crappies all winter long because there's always bugs there because there's usually a, a soft bottom. Bass Galaxy, your chicken nuggets are ready. But that's my favorite wow. thing. I mean, the bass are there too. So, like, we'll side image over a spot, and you'll be able, and that's a really cool thing about fishing basins. They stick out like a freaking sore thumb mm -hmm. because it's the only hard return on a soft bottom. It's the bottom of the butt crack. Yeah, it's the bottom of the butt crack. And sometimes that return is a little... Yeah. Looks like it could be a... It's an irre irregularity on yeah. a flat return on both your forward facing. Yep. Because when you side it's scan over it, you, you know there's nothing there. Yeah. You don't see much. Yeah. And you turn around and yes, it's like, is that a, is that a rock? Yeah. It's not suspended. It's on the bottom. And they can be in some... Really and there's two. Or th yeah. yeah. And you're like, what? Yeah. And then you start seeing more as you're going along. And you're like, okay, so there's... That's what's fun about it, because you can fan cast those spots, because they're really spread out over a big mm -hmm. area. Um, but that soft bottom stuff is wild. And that's where those Ned Rigs and micro baits can be absolutely so much fun. And I get what you're saying with the cold polymer now. Yeah. We're kind of coming full yeah. circle. Yeah. Where you want that line to hover a little bit more because that Ned bait, yeah. that, a jig head and soft bottom, yeah, that's a shovel. Yeah, it's a shovel and, and it'll get stuck. Yep, and you don't want to no. shovel the bottom. And you I want, want to... more control too, so if oh I need to keep God. it above them, yeah. I Pre can. And you're preventing the gumming up of the hook or the yeah. trailer and dragging and you're cleaning your knot and that sort yeah. of thing. Think about a football jig, right? The idea yeah. of a football jig is to, you know get over hard bottom at yeah. efficiently right yeah but a football jig is going to dig soft bottom way yeah. too much so you um, but how Floor do you carbon's do, gonna drive how do you it. give kind of that natural bumping football yeah. jig like action well you need the line to hover it up a little, a little yeah. more hoverness to it yeah because fluorocarbon will just drive it in more because it sinks well have you ever weighed a bug they don't weigh an eighth of an ounce no they don't that's why like i Especially have a in water. tackle box just for it and it's got jig heads and I've made my own, like, weighted finesse hooks, and <laughs> the weighted finesse hooks are sweet. I have to show you that. Yeah, dude. I've been dabbling with that quite a bit, actually. Oh, dude, I feel like uh, the Japanese are the first time I've ever seen a weighted finesse hook, where yeah. the weight's, like, kind of in the middle of the... Yeah. And, oh, my God, I just put... I just figured out why they do that. Yeah. Can you... Hover but... it. Yeah. Yeah. Because that, that weight keeps the hook up, right? Yeah. And if you were to nose hook a little bug bait on it, yeah. you could allow it to kind of scoot over soft bottom. Yeah. You've got that. Without hook driving shape. it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like and a if you taper the ends. With the hook and with the weight in the middle of it. Like, yeah. Yeah. If you Dude. taper the ends of the weights too, you can actually slide it into like that craw. And you can actually just open hook. Just open exposed hook it as well and thread it through the whole bait. You don't get as much action, but. Um, with those bug baits, they'll... Cleaner they'll, cast. Yeah. More efficient cast sometimes is more the deal. Yeah. Than the mm -hmm. action. Yeah. If you will. Yeah. yeah. Just it, getting it, it in front of them. Yeah. The right action 300 feet from them versus mm -hmm. the wrong action right on their nose. Right. Yeah. A bug's going to twitch and it's not going to do My a whole favorite lot. thing with those bugs on that they pattern, eat the dead though, ones too. <laughs> I mojo rig so much. That's my favorite thing to do with the bug baits. Okay, and not a lot like, of people mojo rig. Mm -hmm. No, finesse wide gap hooks, like a wacky rigging hook. And I'll mojo rig to that, and I'll just nose hook the bug baits because they're so small, and it's such a finesse thing. They they usually just suck the whole thing in because they don't feel anything firm. 
The uh-huh. hookup ratio uh-huh. is actually surprising good on those things. I believe it. For me, yeah. my concern is nose hooking yeah. the, the grass and yeah. the, like keeping my bait clean. Well, yeah, that's so, where my leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and a bait that uh, that oh, I uh, will uh, use. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. I will use like mono for that though for my leader just to float it like six, or eight to like really float it. Gotcha. Large mouth, I throw a lot of the eight. Because Kyle Minky's the only other guy who's been on this podcast who swears by a mojo rig, and he's kind of walleye bass guy, you know. Oh, I catch everything. Does, yeah, yeah. And we catch and a ton of crappies on it too. It's that's so his little fun. ace in the hole down south. Yeah, it, his because, dude, not a lot of people throw a mojo rig, and Mm-mm. and I was throwing one on. Uh, Pokegamon practice a little bit last year with Dane, but I'm still learning. I'm definitely still a student. We all are when we were yeah. bass fishing, right? Always yeah. a student, but it's not a confidence always tied up for me type deal. So do you do braid to, braid to that? Oh, uh, yeah. I well, do co- braid. How heavy a weight usually? Because my issue is with a light Carolina that's rig is like tough. A large mouth deal for me. So that basin deal, that's like the a mo- lot. Yeah, mojo rig? so... Well, not the most. I do it for smallies too yep. a lot, but, but the like, basin deal is a that large basin deal. deal is my is one of my favorite largemouth deals around here, and that I I go like ten or twelve pound braid. I beef it up a little more. How about weight on your mojo rig? Like on the, on the on the weight? Yeah. Uh, normally I am doing like an eighth to a three thirty second. Oh wow! Yeah, but and how long a leader? Like three feet, four feet. Yeah. Long, yeah, because I like getting that bait like a foot or two off bottom. Yep, yep, that makes sense. Yeah, I'll use like those, uh, those like the foam earbuds. Yep, I'll cut little chunks of them off, and you can like glue them wherever you want on the plastics, like with mended. Mm. Um, I, I just use toothpicks, toothpicks work too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that works, and you can break up a bunch of them, put them in different places of the bait as well. Or else, I did get some secret Japanese floating baits that probably don't need anything. Yeah, but, they probably don't need anything. Yeah, only, I, the I won't even show those on awesome. camera. But, sorry. Time for the next surprise. Oh. I know you like tiny baits. Uh-huh. So here's one for you. This one is... I told Ross about this one, and they, they have them at Waypoint right now. And I'm Are just sure curious. you want to show it quite yet? I'm cool, man. <laughs> That's nasty. You know what would be really good for that? Side hooking that with one of those tungsten spy bait jig heads. I have a way I want to rig it that I'm not going to talk about. But yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of a beefed up Bobby Garland. Dude, mm-hmm. how sick is that? It's got like a huddle style tail. Oh, yeah. I think you could drop shot it. I oh, think easily. you could stroll it on a jig head. Yep. And that's all I'm going to say I'll do with it. You can do everything with it. I'm wondering, yeah, what you would do with it. What 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 do you see for I'd a put an Okashira spin head on it. Ooh. So it's got like, see how that tail's got a little hollowness oh, yeah. to it? Yeah. <laughs> to be honest with you, I'd probably put that. Do you have? Because if, if largemouth are going to eat bugs, gopher? then they got to yeah, love a yeah. baby. The boom. mushroom heads? Don't remember. Oh yeah, I got yeah. some. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So those gopher tackle mushroom heads. Um, I don't know if they even make them anymore. I have a bunch of them still. I'd probably use that and I'd just kill it on the bottom. And just, yep. And just kill it, and then probably do like a big rip, so you dart it. Almost, yeah. I'd probably like fish it like a darter. Almost, I'd fish that probably like an eerie darter. As soon as we're done recording, remind me to tell you my idea for rigging it. Perfect. That thing is juicy. God, they're so tiny. Dude, you know they eat. That is the easiest meal. Yeah. For a bass. Oh yeah. It's a flat bluegill. Yep. It sucks easy. Oh yeah. Soft. And it the, nom, the nom. cool thing is, it doesn't matter how still you keep it, it's not going to stop moving. That's just it. Yeah. Nom, 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 yeah. Nom, it's nom. just it's going to bob. Num num. Num num. The shading on the rocks is out of this world. So yeah, this company is called Engine. Uh-huh. And yeah, Japanese company. They got... Dude, there's a whole new world over in that country, you mm-hmm. know? It's a whole different world. Yeah. 
the way those guys think about the sport is freaking insane. And they, for whatever reason, they focus on the two extremes, either gigantic baits or the most finessey micro baits you'll ever see. Right. Like you get, like you don't see a lot, um, uh, you don't see football jigs coming from Japan very often. They make Um, good ones. I mean, they make good ones, but it's not like a huge pattern over there where it's like there's a billion different jig companies. For them, it's like Microsoft Plastics and hard baits that you see a ton of. Well, so for them, it's like they get, you think Tonka gets pressure? Uh-huh. Like for them, it's like, yeah, th- they're ahead of us in terms of fishing pressure. Oh, so. yeah. For a lot of these finesse baits, I'm just curious if you've tried these. Have you tried the Elite Series uh, lineup on Northland tackles, like tungsten football? Not yet. Jigs, Not yet. And I've they're, heard really good And their Ned so. Rig stuff. Dude. Yeah. The deal. Yeah. I've heard really good. And things. they're doing smeltnaders now. Uh huh. That I Ned, that. that Ned hook, that Gami hook on that mm-hmm. Ned head. Oh my god! Dude. You see uh, Gussie's new wrap, huge Northland on the side. It's so badass. Yeah. Paying homage to the North, baby. Dude, I'll be honest. It's just sweet to see them. They're. I'll be okay. when I was a kid. Yeah. They're like it was cool, but their hooks sucked. Yeah. Now a lot of that's because of Jason Charlie. <laughs> oh yeah, dude. Yeah. Jason Charlie are great dudes. Yeah. Good fishermen too. Hammers. And it doesn't matter what species. Yeah. Look you like that. that little football jig? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you like that little football jig? When do you so when do you throw that little football jig versus like a net head? That's my I question. actually for the little football jigs, I kinda only do one thing with them. I use them as my baby tube inserts. My baby tube hooks. Noted. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yep, that makes like, sense. My favorite one is the um, is the owner tungsten one. Okay. Yep. And then yep. I cut the weed guard on it because it has the little, it's like that synthetic wire weed guard where there's like four or five strands. Mm-hmm. And I cut it so there's like maybe a sixteenth or a thirty second of an inch of that exposed. Yep. I wet the tube jig, slide it in there now, and that little weed guard. If you push on it a little bit, it digs into the plastic, yeah. and it keeps the tube from sliding up the oh, line. Oh, yeah, 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 I got it you. Ke- it holds it. and It's a kickstand. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's freaking awesome. So by, by the time the I've caught like five or six smallies on it now, the actual tube is just getting ripped up, and it's not sliding up the line. And so I just pre-rig like 20 of them. And just have them all dialed in and ready and quarter ounces you ever, my favorite. You ever throw some of that Billy Rub in there? No. You ever do like the crawfish? I have, the... uh, it's made by Johnson. Johnson. Um, so like the Johnson Beetle Spins and such. Okay. Wait, they... wait. We're talking Johnson, not Johnson, and Johnson's brother. Not Johnson and Johnson, right? Not Johnson. Straight not Big Johnson. Pharma. The one that makes not silver minnow. Yes. Johnson silver minnow sauce. Yep. yep. I didn't even know they made sauce. Yeah, they make this scale sauce. It's like scale a bunch sauce. of giant flex that is in like a craw or bait fish scent. Yep. And it's like a it's powder a paste. Oh. Yeah. And you can and so like when you snap a tube, it okay. leaves cut. I'm just kidding. But seriously, that's juicy. Yep. I know about that trick. I don't know about that stuff, but I'll have to show I'll send you a picture of it. If you can find it, I don't know if they still make it. That makes fish bite flakes. Oh, it's weird. Scales falling off of a bait fish. Oh, and it rip leaves a, a freaking cloud of it when you snap it. So I'll go, like, on like during a tournament for smallies, I'll, like, use half a tube a day. It's like sprinkles falling off a donut. You're like, ah, nom, nom, nom. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> it's wild. It's like the old Mentos tube trick. Oh. What? Yeah, or peptid, or the yeah, anti-acid. The peptid. Yep, that's yeah, what it whatever is. The peptid. It, yeah. Peptobismol? The fizzing. Or the, oh. The fizzing. Guys Alka-Seltzer will, tablets, too. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So they'll toss that in tubes on bed fishing derbies. Yeah. Really piss them off. Oh, oh it pisses them off. I can't remember who told me about that. It might have been Willard telling me about that, that he used to do that on Tonka, on the bed fish. Old school. Yeah. yeah. What yeah. would you guys do with this crabby? So supposedly these are sold out everywhere, and suppose at first I'm like, eh, I mean, it's another crabby, right? But then I'm like, I would do what I you like and took I one out about. of the package, and I'm like, actually, okay, that's a different, yeah, crabby. 
I'd swing at that thing Hollow all claws, day long. <laughs> hollow belly. Yeah. And just... Yeah, I'd swing at that thing all day long. And they I am the crawfish man! They smell so good, too. <gasps> Juddy. It does smell good. So you yeah. would swing at this? Yeah, I'd swing at it. This is called the Raid Zeraganist. I'd also Carolina rig that thing for sure. Oh, I wonder how buoyant it would be on a sea rig. They have like three packs left. And that color is a really good color too. Yeah. Like you, you've yeah. seen them big craws. They're kind of big and ugly like this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you'd swing head that? Yep. Okay. I don't know. I, I don't always get into these, but this one, I've never seen a bay like that. It's freaking weird. I don't know... I don't know when I'm gonna throw it, but I'm gonna mess with it. Yeah. I don't know. You can only mess with so many things, but like, I guarantee there's probably some listeners who are like, I've been looking for that. <laughs> it's a good looking bait. Dude, that, have you been there yet? Have you been in that place? Waypoint? Yeah. No, I actually haven't. I've oh been. Oh my God. I've been. <laughs> I've had one of the busiest winners I've ever had. I don't know you if you might know need this. to bring your wife with you. Waldo, she no, might be mad if you no, go without No, I'll spend her. too much money. Waldo likes to sit really around pissed. and not do much in the winter. He just kind of home, homebody. If I could do that, I would. <laughs> Dude, so tell me about Crappie Chronicles because I yeah. do want to get into that. It's kind of like a big freaking deal. Crappie killer. I love it. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun. It turned into just a... Like a fun shits and giggles project that, I mean, in between, like, panfish tournaments for Griff and I, we had nothing else really going on besides doing some scouting. And Bart had just uh, had just either lost his job or left his job and wanted to start his own media company, so this kind of kicked it off. And we all enjoyed chasing giant crappies around here, and so we said, screw it, let's just do it, see how it goes went really well and then we did the second season and then the second season is when it really started blowing up so we just that's what we just started doing all winter long and it's turned into a business now and it's a lot of fun dude that is so sick yeah it was pretty cool it didn't start out as something that we thought was going to be huge we just were doing it as like a passion project and it freaking exploded it's weird how that works when you just pursue something that yeah, you're passionate. You're passionate about, about yes. and uh, authentically passionate about, and all of a sudden, and you just focus on that, and then all of a sudden, it's like, look at you now. Yeah, and it's it just freaking clicked. It was absolutely nuts. I, I still can't believe it is where it is now, and I mean, it, it's just something that we all enjoy and love doing. And the big thing is, is like Griff and I love teaching people how to catch crappies and seeing light bulbs go off in people's heads where they finally get it and it clicks yep um and there's multiple times we get to see that where it's either oh they learn jigging cadences or they learn um fish behavioral patterns on their electronics um or they learn like higher percentage areas to start when breaking down lakes like there's multiple light bulbs we'll see click and go off and it's just really cool seeing that so that's what we probably get the most enjoyment out of is that and then Bart is an exceptionally good storyteller. And so He is. I'm just kidding. Yeah, and Pink is a really good cook, so we all have our roles that Yeah. yeah. It just worked really really well. For so, sure. So, yeah, things just clicked and it turned into what it is now. Have you ever spent any time with Pinkala? No. Me neither. I want to. He seems like a super cool dude. Oh, he's awesome. I'd love he's, to tie uh, with him and and do his dishes. I've I've spent he's, a lot of time with like um I mean Bart, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and you, Waldo, for yeah. quite a few years. Yeah. Um, even the old man of the group, you know, yeah. we've spent some time together. Yeah, Griff, because he know? fishes talk all the time. Yeah, we yeah. fish a lot of open water stuff together, and I just saw him the other day. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, not uh, not yeah. Pink. I I don't think I've ever. Pink is uh, he's a huge kayak guy, and then he's a big multi-species guy. So he mm-hmm. doesn't he doesn't dabble too hard in bass. I mean, he does, and he's he's a good multi-species fisherman so he picks up bass fishing just like the rest of us and he uh he's just very well versed in all fishing aspects mm-hmm. which is really cool 
So, like, one day he's uh, kayak fishing 40-inch pike in the backwaters, and the next day he's taking his boat out of Lake Michigan and trolling for salmon. So, like, he does all sorts of stuff. One yeah, of my he's favorite He's just things, a fishy dude. Oh. He's just fishy. One of my favorite things he does doesn't even have to deal with fish. He has a commercial frog gigging license. Yeah. Ribbit. What? Yeah. Yeah, I saw bullfrogs along the river. Uh-huh. Attention all bastronauts. This podcast is supported by the Bass Galaxy's title sponsor, Waypoint Angler Supply, the Midwest's new landing pad for hardcore anglers just like you and me. If you're looking for the sneaky goods you can't find anywhere else, look no further. Waypoint Angler Supply has the largest offering of JDM tackle in the Midwest, and they are right here in Minnesota on Lake Minnetonka. This is truly a place every bass fisherman in Minnesota needs to visit because we finally have a tackle shop in the state that's as dreamy as the ones you find down south. And the staff at Waypoint Angler Supply understands the various needs of us anglers, which is why you'll find the selection there so enticing. Ross and the folks at Waypoint Angler Supply are passionate about carrying the right stuff, providing an authentic customer experience, and they listen to the anglers. And it doesn't end at JDM Baits. They stock all the top U.S. brands, as well as local Minnesota brands like the Selka Fishing and Customs, Arsenal Fishing, Bait Lab Custom Swim Baits, All Terrain Tackle, Bagley Northland, Outcast Tackle, and more. So stop into their store on Lake Minnetonka or visit their website, waypointanglersupply.com. That's waypointanglersupply.com. Use the code GALAXY0124 for the month of March to save 20% on your next order. Spears them. Harpoons them. What? Yeah. Yeah. I want to do that. It's badass. At night, and he'll have... Tons of them. Yeah, it's badass. Dude, when are the Bullfrog Chronicles coming out? That I know, right? sick. It's freaking sweet, and they taste amazing. I want to stab some bullies. Oh my gosh, you made frog legs for me? I've never had them before. I'm like, okay, this is going to be weird. It, just like chicken. My grandma made me try them as a kid, and I was like, these are good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're really good. But yeah, he does some crazy stuff, but... Uh, I want a bullfrog like with him, and I want to bring like a dart gun, like a blowgun. Yeah. Like, blowgun some bullfrogs? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Oh, you sick. easily could. You really? easily, Yeah, you easily could. Well, easy, man. And then you've never you seen me go, blow a blowgun. You've never seen the amount of bullfrogs that he's on. If my blowgun's sighted in, I don't think we'll have an issue. You'll be three feet away from him. <laughs> oh, shit. That sounds barbaric now. <laughs> yeah. You're literally, like, at night, the light blinds him. Oh, gotcha. It's just, like, spotlight and deer. <laughs> <laughs> Bullfrogs like, <laughs> except you know, just like that frogs. one time we were shooting the buck out the window of the truck, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's the same thing. You shine a light. And they By just the way, stop. that never that never happened. No, no, for <laughs> legal reasons that never occurred. No. I feel like we've just gone through a paradigm, like yeah. to a smaller land where these bullfrogs are down there, like at night, and all of a sudden, like like they're starting to write the Old Testament, right? Yeah, they see the light of like, God yeah, come down, like, and, and they're, they're like. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, hell, I can't see. And I cannot went... see. Ah, <laughs> oh, oh, it is the Lord. It is the devil. <laughs> you were gigged by the pink. A ribbit. It's a shrubbery. <laughs> it's a we have a night to see. That's a great show. A shrubbery. You must cut down the tallest tree in the forest. We a herring. <laughs> a herring. It's a uh, great, great movie. It's a South African swallow. <laughs> it's different than the East, East Mediterranean swallow. <laughs> it's such a good show. Dude, Real. I would pay so much money to watch teal gig frogs. Oh, yeah. Same. Is that what gig and frogs means? Yeah, yeah. frog gigging. Dude, I just understood like five new con- five country songs now make sense. Yeah, yeah. That's what frog gigging is. Take my out gigging frogs. Those, they gotta be what? Five, six feet long? Bird dog sing Are they yeah, longer like eight? Song I no, think I think they're, they're, they're like shorter. five or six feet long. Dude, gotta gotta big and rich. And they've got big like a micro Save a horse, on it. ride a cowboy. 
So I took him out gigging frogs, introducing to my old bird dog or yeah. singer every Willie Nelson song I could think of. We made love and yeah, I and saddled like, up my You'll be in like an offshoot of the river and you'll shine the light and there's just, they're everywhere. Dude. Everywhere. Yeah. Do they make, do they even make frogs big enough to imitate those? Dude, he has a commercial license. Uh, the old Spro, uh, King the Daddy. King Daddy. King Daddy. Frog. Yeah, the King Daddy. If, well, it sounds like if the bass fishing population knew how many bullfrogs were on that riverside, they might throw a little bit bigger frog yeah. next year. Yeah, King when Daddy. They, when they get on down to them mud boat lines. Well, you've seen the, uh, who was it, Randall Tharp that caught a frog on a frog? <laughs> I mean, they're huge. They're stinking monsters. Who can say that, that they've caught a frog on a frog? I have no idea. Is I've... that live footage, too? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was when they were on the cross. Mm -hmm. You ever catch a frog on a frog? Uh, I smoked I a deer say. with a frog. I can't say I have. I want to say I've smoked a stogie with a frog. I have not done that. <laughs> no, there was a deer walking on shore, and I was shore fishing, and I was in high school. Wound up. I had just gotten this Quantum Smoke 150. I put bulk oh, of bearings in it. Quantum smoked a deer. Oh, I, I smoked its ass. I freaking drilled it right in the side. It just made a thud, and it just ran. What did you hit it with? A frog. frog. <laughs> <laughs> you were trying to snag a deer I with a frog. I launched that KVD rattling frog right into its side. It was funny as hell. Boys will be boys. Oh, yeah. I was young and dumb. It was oh. great, though. We've all done lots Little... of dumb stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. I had no thought go through my mind. of What if you actually hooked it? <laughs> Frogs eat bugs. <laughs> Deer don't. <laughs> Deers don't eat frog either. <laughs> deer don't eat frogs. Yeah, no. <laughs> All the deers. <laughs> it was bad. Yeah, dude. What? Like, yeah, that's like. Yeah. What, what were you thinking? <laughs> I don't even know what I was thinking. I was like, oh, this will be funny. <laughs> uh, the next shirt design I make is going to be a guy casting a frog at a buck. <laughs> With the crosshairs on the buck. Trophy oh, yeah. trophy hunting. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. Or a fisherman casting out a 12-pointer or a 14-pointer. Dude, oh, yeah. that's actually a big Maybe I'll sure. drag him into the water. Dude, it'd and be then good do, it, do it on the moon, and then it could be a bass galaxy. And then we'll donate all the proceeds to a 4-H club. Oh, my God, dude. Nobody's doing anything for the 4-H folk. You know what I mean? I never... Who's helping out the 4-H folk? You got farmers in Scotland club is. losing oh, their livelihoods. If we don't shit. protect our local 4-H clubs, we're going to lose them. Dude, he doesn't even know what, the, what 4-H is. No. I don't even what know. What the fuck? I've been living under a rock the last two years. Think of like Boy Scouts for, for like outdoors men and women what shooting guns. What the armadillo guns, basket shooting... weaving are you talking about not knowing what a 4-H club is? I do is? not. It's weird. Be I'm like a community weird. of anglers and adults and kids getting together to teach like gun safety and all of oh, those okay. things. Showing Ice fishing, cattle, like, oh, showing sheep. Yep. Uh, farming, uh, garden, farming. like all of like self sustainability, outdoorsy, yeah. oh, everything. Badass. But it's all collective as a group. It's basically it's, preserving the American way. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And the fact that our youth is. It's being lost in our youth. We definitely need to fundraise for that shit. Me and Davey Cook did a 4-H presentation for a bunch of ice fishing kids up in Alexandria a couple years ago. Really? Oh, that's sick. Mm -hmm. yep. Taught them like, a little bit about building rods and ice fishing for crappies and how we use electronics. And then we shot archery and we did a whole thing up there. Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. That's sick. I'm just trying to think dope. of this charity right now. Um, it's going to be 4-4-H. Four, four, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. 4 4 H, and then what's before the 4 4 H? Doesn't need to be, it's just 4 4 H. Casting frogs at deer, 4 4 H. No, catching trophies, 4 4 H. Ooh. That's a good one. I'll start the paperwork process. Gigging for kidding. H. You know what we need to do is just start another business. No, no, no. How about no, Scott? How about no? But, and nor do I think we should start a charity around this because we've got a lot of irons in the fire, but I think we could make this just a public service announcement. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. We should Support raise money for Support your Sh local 4-H chapters for fuck's sake. And the St. Jude's Children's Research. Yeah, yeah, I just saw that. You just launched yours. Yeah. Well, I mean. Yeah. What? 
I'll be honest with you. Uh, Waypoint's partnered with the St. Jude. Oh, so they're doing yeah. a promotion where if you enter, you get in the drawing for a Waypoint gift card. That's Benefits sick. go to St. Jude, obviously. Blah, 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 blah. Are you fishing uh, with St. Jude? No, but it probably looks like I did because yeah. Post Glenn and I did. Well, Instagram it, gives you I this option. I thought you were fishing it with Glenn. I was like, oh, okay, that's When you cool. make an Instagram reel, there's this little button that says, add a fundraiser. And mm-hmm. I was like, making the Instagram reel. And I looked and I was like, oh, I wonder if St. Jude's is on there. So I hit add fundraiser and then it gives the search bar. Yeah. And I did search St. Jude. I was like, well, yeah. I mean, if we're making a post, we might as well like give people the option to donate money. Yeah. So I just made a fundraiser. Minimum's 500 bucks to be able to enter, so I set it at 500 Price at the bar a little low, but I guess to clarify, yeah, that's what well, okay. it's a gener- generic Did you guys hear about that Opens Angler that had to pull out of all the Open tournaments this year because they found out his daughter has a rare cancer and is being submitted into the St. Jude's mm-hmm. Hospital Program and all that? No. no. Yeah, man. Um, God, um, That's not awesome. Zona. Uh, Mercer had on his podcast a little detailed description about it just the other day. Did he have the guy on? Uh, no, he dropped. Okay. He name dropped and set up like a GoFundMe type thing. He didn't set up the GoFundMe, but the family did. And mm-hmm. It's it's a super sad story, but hopefully, uh, I mean, there's a ton of supporters out there of St. Jude and those who you know go through that. It's I, I can't imagine having children of my own kind of go through some of that but as a tournament angler it's hard because now you're pulling out of all of your tournaments and that's you know that's your living that's your career that's i mean a big part of your income and i shouldn't say like it's that profitable of a business but it totally diverts all of your attention so yeah mad props to saint jude's and those who are willing to put in the time to raise money for it and if you can go and support anglers like that, and you have, I mean, five bucks, ten bucks, twenty bucks. It's a cool thing to do, you know. Dude, those kids get to stay expense free. Can you imagine being a parent, bringing Ugh. your kid in, oh man, and then dealing with the financial heart? Like well, you're, you're already dealing yeah. with the grieving health, yeah. right? The, the emotional aspect, but then you add financial hardship to that, yeah. and it's, it's, it feels like it would be unbearable. So like, it's such a good yeah. organization, and and I guess. I, I can admit this, and this is a, probably a good time just to be grateful because I think that we cheat death daily, and we take oh, yeah. life for granted, and it's it's things like the St. Jude that like helps me take a step back and like say, man, I'm really grateful for you guys, man. I'm grateful yeah. that you guys are in good health. Uh, I'm grateful I'm in good health. Like We get to bass fish. You get to crappie kill. Kill a crappie. Mm-hmm. I mean... We get to do some pretty cool things, and if you look at the world, I mean, if you are if you make thirty five thousand dollars a year, you are below the poverty line in the United States, but you are in the top one percent of the world. It's insane, isn't that weird? Mm-hmm. So, okay, life's about perspective, right? Yeah. And I think every single day we wake up, we forget that. Oh yeah, we forget a lot of things. It's easy to. We get caught up in the day-to-day rush. We get caught up in this. We get caught up in that. Like, Bart's yelling at you to catch another freaking crappie that's not an eater. Because did you, you have those, your limit already. Did you see those three-pound crappies they were catching? Two and three-quarter-pound crappies yeah. they were catching? You know we weigh bass in that size sometimes. Dane and I weighed in more yeah. than we'd care to admit <laughs> this yeah. past season. Yeah. Yeah, it was a big one. We got some giants. So that was in Minnesota? Yeah, it was within 60 miles of the metro. Two to three quarter, two and three quarter to three pound crappie. Oh yeah, and the scary thing is, is a guy got a nineteen and a half on one of the lakes like two weeks ago. Annoying. Why? 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 Yeah, it was like it's got to be four and a quarter. Close. Oh my god. Yeah, that's why we film around here, and that's the whole premise, like why we started the show, is because those crappies do live around here. Now Griff has caught them, but actually getting them on film is one of the hardest things ever. It's insane. Getting fish catches on film is it's dude, insane. Goofy. It yeah. is why okay, that is weird because that is such a thing. Yep. Fish. It, it never it, goes right when you're filming. It's almost like you <laughs> took a piss on your bait. Yeah. And threw it in the water and the fish like it's almost like they know. Yeah. Do you think it's because okay, fishing is so mental. 
Oh yeah. Such a mental sport. And I think that camera is 100% mental. We're so used to it now. We don't even think about it. But they still don't show up when it's on. Yeah, it's just so, getting the stars to align on film days and getting the perfect conditions. Because, like, a lot of these fish get caught by guys that are out there every single day after work. And we can't do that because we have to edit. We have other, we have our day jobs. We have families. And so it's impossible to do that. And getting us all together on a specific day when it's the perfect conditions and the stars align, it's incredibly difficult. See, from the outside looking in, I would be like, Jeez, these guys literally have all winter. Yeah. Why, you know, why is that an issue? Oh, yeah. You have every day, all day, all winter to yeah, put we that don't, season yeah. together. Me, but Griff. Truth be told, you're Pete. actually professionals. You're under the gun a little bit. You don't yeah. have a lot of time no. to catch. And especially like a year crappy. like this, we had two weeks, three weeks in the Metro of good, solid ice to film. Yeah, you're not filming just one episode. No. You're filming 12, a 10, whole season. 11, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's tough. It's not easy. Well, I'm curious genuinely about like power powering cameras. Lift, yeah. Like this is a little bit. It's a personal question because we're talking about it for the trailer with, mm-hmm. uh, you know, potentially having a boat down. Yeah. To, like doing live coverage out of the boat potentially and That's stuff. That's the Bassmaster class. But power is yeah. going to be an issue. Yeah. And basically, I need two plugins. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Three plugins with a camera. Dakota Lithium Power Box. That's what you need. It's Dakota. got a 110 inverter in it, the Power Box 135. I mean, I can run my Traeger on it for like two weeks. No way. Yeah. So I could run this. We could do a three, you four could hour. You could run your whole setup off that. Could we do it for how many days? Could we do. Well, you would charge it you every charge night. It. Yeah. Every night. But I could do 12 hours of. It'll last for 12 oh, hours. Oh, yeah. It's a 135 amp hour, amp hour battery. How much does one of these run? Uh, they're expensive. They're like a couple tw- grand. They're like twelve hundred bucks, huh. thirteen hundred bucks. I think it's like a generator. I mean that. Yeah. I mean, and then that's you relevant. Can, you can get them up to like two grand if you like do the solar panel options. So okay, which what if I only need six hours a day? Can I get a I smaller think, version? I think they make like, a power box sixty. I don't know if they still do. I thought they had a smaller one though, but I, they have the power box tens, which are the little ones. But that's for like USB charging your phone, charging like you could run the GoPro off of it. Those are like a hundred and twenty bucks, something like that. But you could run a GoPro off that. Like when I'm doing like my scouting missions and filming alone, that's what I have my GoPro mounted to. So it's not just a chest mount view. And it, it'll run that thing for two weeks. It's a very low current draw. We're gonna table that and we're, I'm gonna be in touch with you yeah. about couple of those things here yeah i might few weeks so. i don't know if i have Heads it in my truck i might potentially have it in my truck where you can at least see it but it's got two 110 plugs could i run a power strip off of it for more plugs yeah okay yep. then we're good yeah yep absolutely super doable it's just figuring out the cost thing. yeah because i even... don't know how often i'm gonna use it but oh. then again we can then do podcasts from the boat i just lost my headset did yeah perfect time because i need to go to the bathroom perfect pee break so i i I noticed that immediately in one of the latest crappie chronicles i was like dude waldo's like fucking looking good dude he's taking care of himself yeah have you ever so a what are you doing and b have you ever tried 75 hard or have you heard of it or considered it no i've never tried that what's your secret to your chiseled tone yeah started bow hunting and rocking do you say rocking rocking yeah it's like a weighted backpack yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a way. So you hike, so, but you add a shitload of weight because. Do they call them muck rucks? Kind of like the shoes they wear is muck <laughs> No, no, that's funny. The <laughs> Waldo's a muck rucker. <laughs> I'm a muck rucker. Muck rucker. <laughs> that could be taken in a lot of different ways. You got a dang muck rucker. <laughs> yeah. I could. Oh wait. <laughs> and do it in the. Ah. Uh... Yeah. This podcast is brought to you by My Wedge Transom Savers, the finest horse semen transportation device in the land, and it will save your outboard motor from fatigue, especially <laughs> in the tilt and trim section. Isn't that correct, Miss of Osaka? I love my My Wedge. It is you run a couple of wedgies. Dude, I've been, that's the only thing I've ever ran. Yeah. I'm just wondering Tandem wedges. if Danny has used them to <laughs> <laughs> reproduce 
with horses. Okay. You thought you I was see, going dildo. You, you <laughs> thought I was going dildo. Like, and the geez. answer is yes, I was. But I was saying horse dildo with real semen in it used for real practical purposes to carry on the bloodlines of the good genetics and the next barrel racing sea biscuits I'm to just come. glad we clarified that because... <laughs> Well, think about that thing, dude. Didn't you drill a hole through through the tip of a my wedge, throw some horse semen in that thing, dude. I mean, I'm gonna call Mark if if we think it can be done. I think he's got a whole new window of opportunity with the my wedge. It is quite the business model, Mister Teal. It is very very lucrative. Dude, it's a cool invention, and like transom savers are have gotten a lot to be a lot of money. And you can get a my wedge for like forty five bucks. I just like how it's not stiff metal. Cause like you gotta think, like the motor supports are strong and solid. They've made them so much better over the years. But what I think the my wedge does versus a lot of these other transom savers out there is you have a lot of electronics now in motors. Yeah. Those those CPUs and everything, yeah, they're very shock proof, but to a certain extent, it's going to wear down on the mounts for the CPUs and the control boards and just the individualized components on there. That's a lot of impact and shock of trailering a boat. So if you're using just a straight-up metal, like, mate-style um, transom saver, you got to think to a certain extent that that jarring is going to loosen up like capacitors, resistors, transformers on circuit boards, like, and so there's the my wedge is nice because it's rubber. Right. There's shock right. absorption to that as well. So I think that's why I like them. The cost is also really nice too. If you've ever driven through the outskirts of Atlanta, or how and about when seen we're in potholes? South Dakota? Oh yeah, just the blah, 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 yeah blah. ripping you down about, dirt roads. Even the metal ones that go to tilt and trim, it's like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I stopped using them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I felt like everything was jarring around in the motor. So, yeah, that, I actually switched because I was using my wedges. Then I went to like those, those heavy duty metal bracketed ones. I went actually back to my wedge because I felt like it was just better on my motor. Mm -hmm. I agree. I yeah. did the same thing. Yep. I did the same thing. Yeah, you always got to try the cool new stuff, and then you realize, yep, yeah, well, my wedge is still the best. Dude, and it, what's, what I like about it is it fits in that rear compartment, Yeah, you know, yeah. spot of the boat. It, yeah. It's like, it tucks away nice. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Do you remember in the legend, I had like that little phone <coughs> area where yeah. it's that little plastic flip-up piece, like, on oh, the yeah, out. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, Fit right in there. Perfect. Like It was a, like it was made a, for it. Like a glove? Yeah. Yeah, dude. It was perfect. And those, you know, you think how beefed up transoms have become. I mean, look at our Vexus models. I yeah. can beef, I can mount Raptors right to the back, which, by the way, yeah. I, I bought two I this year yeah, finally. I, I don't yeah. look so weird on the <laughs> tournament trail. Well, but but those new transoms, I mean, dude, they, yeah. you're hanging. You're a lot plenty of weight fat. off. Them. Yeah. yeah. It's the tilt and trim that, yeah. like, that gets it's really. It's those hydraulics and the electronics that I'm probably the most concerned about on the motor. You tow your boat down the road without anything supporting that tilt it's and trim. It's jarring it's, so hard. It is. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Bad. Not to mention, I think the rubber on the My Wedge is going to lubricate better for, you know, horse reproduction. Yeah. And it and the horse is definitely going to like the feeling of a My Wedge a lot better. Wouldn't you agree, Dan? <sighs> <laughs> Mark, I think you it's have a new business a opportunity. This is a this is a real thing. I mean, we can get them into the ruby buckle and get them, you know, to really transfer some expensive semen, some horse semen. Right. I mean, we can really. How much is that worth? Depends on the horse, I'm guessing. Dude, they're selling ruby yeah. buckle like incentivized horses for over millions of dollars <laughs> for one horse. Dude, they pay more for horse cum than human cum. <laughs> they, they, there are horses out there that before. I think it depends on the human as well. Like, they freeze One vials million of semen. dollar sperm. <laughs> what, bro? Yes, the the sperm that they freeze and the embryos and like all that stuff that they hold on to and they save after these horses like, die. That's this where the money's. Dick at. is made of gold. It's insane <laughs> how much money they spend on that stuff, dude. That's what? Wild. 
millions and millions and millions of dollars. Man. Holy crap. Yeah. But anyways. Do you know how much they could save if they just used the my wedge? We were talking about reproduction, but... I'm thinking more production. You, you. I oh. heard something about the new Vexus models that come out. And I have never even stepped foot oh, in yeah, one. Oh yeah, that's right. You and I were just looking at them at that brochure. You're like, oh, the, the production of the. I'm like, well, because I'm like, there's like a twenty, and then there's like what a twenty. Is it X? VX twenty and VX twenty one is what they originally came out with, and that bass boat was like no bass boat that was built. It was almost like your big water retired folk loved it. Oh, yeah. Right? It was one of the best riding boats that still I've is. ever been in. Yep, still yeah. is. Uh, but it's taller. Yeah. You stand, you know, you're. Lo- it's it's too big maybe for some people. It's a sight and, fisherman's bass boat, though. You know, you get a man full of testosterone, and sometimes all he wants to do is go fast, right? Yeah. So uh, the boats, it's funny because people would call the VX-20 and VX-21 slow. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, they must not have ridden in one when it was three footers and it was takeoff morning because those boats are the fastest boats on yeah. the water if it's bumping. Everyone likes to talk about flat, calm speed running scenarios. What's impressive is when a boat can go 55 and three footers yep. and not even skip a beat. Yeah. And that's what that boat does. Yeah. It's badass. So I guess that, that's but it, the, the to cool keep thing is you have deck space with it too, because like my boat ran amazing in in rough water, but it was super narrow, mm. so I did not have the deck space. It was amazing handling, um, throttle control was great, the and a lot of that's for how I had it set up. But those Vexes, is you have that, but also insane amount of deck space. I mean, they're dude. aircraft carriers, damn spaceship. Yeah, yeah, dude, so epic to fish off of, and I guess. So they wanted something that was a little bit normal bass boat, yeah. like, right? Yeah. More, more the sh- the size and the real estate <clears throat> yeah. of a normal bass boat. Now the, with speed and handling. Yeah. So they came out with just the just this year the VXS twenty. So it's twenty foot six inches. Okay. Versus the twenty is twenty feet eleven inches. Yeah. So that's kind of the major difference. I'm gonna pull the page up here, but like. That VXS twenty. That's I'm gonna run one this year, or the VXS twenty. Excuse me. So yeah, that's twenty foot six inches versus the VX twenty was twenty foot eleven inches. So slightly it's just shorter. slightly shorter, but you're really not losing much deck space at all. You're just losing a little bit of storage depth. Okay. So it's the same hull yeah. as a VX twenty, same bottom. So you're oh, getting that same. So the big thing about a Vexus. So it's is, like they're cutting weight then. Cutting or in the, redistributing the weight. That's totally what they're doing. Is yeah. how do we get this to be more of a seventy mile an hour tournament loaded boat? Yeah, and a mid seventies. God, and that just blows my mind, boat. dude. Because my boat, I remember on Big Stone, our boat side by side were doing seventy two, and I had three quarter tank of gas and all of my tournament stuff in it. I think they got a fast one. They well, yeah. thing, fuck, I've noticed there's a mercury aspect barks. of it with humidity. Okay, barks. the, the mercs, the mercs don't run hard in humidity. So those guys down south, that that bait is so freaking perfect. Wait until I get the highlights Dude. in that thing. Oh my god, <laughs> it's freaking. Is he good or what? I'd eat that. The Harbor Tattoo Studio, Dane Veselka, master tattoo artist. He's doing a DT right now, and it looks just out of this world. So a Vexus Hall, though. What's unique about a Vexus hull is the 19 degree dead rise, and they're yeah. running that chisel all the way back. Yeah. So you've got a 19 degree aggressive dead rise all the way back. That makes it run great. Now you now you slim it down. Yeah. You're gonna have a lower center of gravity yet. And but this VXS 20, yeah, it's a lighter, shorter, smaller mm. boat technically, but it's got that same. Dead rise it's got it. that same it's ride. It's got the same chisel. You still yeah. get the airwave pedestals. Huge. So you, if you aren't landing on that chisel, if you land on this side or this side of the boat and you have those things pumped up, it's going to be soft. And I think where this VXS20 <laughs> is going to be money is shallow water maneuverability. Yeah. I think it's going to be a lot more nimble on the pedal yeah. than what we're used to, which to me is a really good thing. I think guys like 
certain people like a bass boat that feels nimble, and certain that people like a boat that me. feels extremely Beef. spacious, big, yeah. brick shit tank, house like tank, tank like, yeah. right? So this is going to be more. I would say I like the nimble. For me personally, I like to Especially be able to. Especially if there's not a flatter bottom, that's going to hurt my back more. Like yeah. if they're putting like that great riding hull they built, yeah. and then all the other features and attributes that anglers want. Yeah. What speed, nimbleness, maneuverability. Yeah. You're going to sacrifice a little bit of storage because the thing about the VX20, VX21 mm-hmm. is, I, I mean, they're you all could... fairly nimble though. I would say your control in big water with them, being able to surf them, is. You could smuggle a dozen immigrants in that VX20 or <laughs> VX21 storage. Yeah, and you can get that thing on pad. The whole shot's amazing. Like that. Not There's on pad, really no complaint, complaints. Like out of the hole. As anglers, we develop special bonds with our equipment. There's something magical when you find that perfect jig rod and reel combo for a technique that elevates your confidence on the water. Whether it's a perfectly balanced, crisp, and sensitive jig rod that gives you the highest level of control over your bait, allows you to feel every grain of sand, every bite, and allows you to drive that hook clean, or a rod with the perfect action and taper that seems to keep your chatter bait, swim bait, or whatever it is, in the back of the bass's head where it belongs no matter where you throw it, or a rod that allows you to effortlessly cast a lighter bait you used to cuss at, on your old combo. These types of magical bonds are rare to find in a mass-produced sweatshop, which is why the Selka Fishing and Customs came to existence, with the sole purpose of bringing you closer to your passion by enhancing the bond with you, your rod, and the bass. Confidence is everything in bass fishing, and there's no bigger boner buster than losing a big fish, not feeling like you can present your bait correctly the list goes on and on mr veselka is a full-blown artesian craftsman who can build you the perfect rod no matter the size or action custom exactly the way you want it he also has a wide variety to choose from right on his website including fan favorites like the eight foot hair jig rod the drop shot rod swim bait rod the chatter chicken rod the mh workhorse and more even ice fishing, you do the whole frozen Swiss cheese thing, the ice fishing, seen grumpy old men? Well, you can send that jiggle stick back to the antique store because Mr. Veselka builds custom ice rods in all sizes and actions too. So head on over to his website, veselkafishing.com. That's V-O-C-E-L-K-A fishing.com. To enhance your confidence on the water, feel your passion, and catch more bass, baby. All a thing can drop. Yeah. Dude, fast. Fast. And they yeah. don't, and what's crazy is people think they're such a barge, but it's like, dude, that drafts the same water as any other boat. It mm-hmm. gets into shallow water. It's just, I understand. Do you remember what Sobe said to me when I came out of uh, Big Stone Lake? And he's like, there's no fucking way you got back into that creek. Yes. There's no way. That's right. And he's in that aluminum boat. And I said, dude, I took my VX20 over six dude, inches of water. Anybody who says that Hell VX20, yeah. like a Vexus is with, glass boat with a, a Marshall, boat. With a Marshall in the boat? Nobody could get their boat to where Dane got to. I didn't try, but he, yeah. Dude, that was wild. The thing, the thing is, it sits and displays his water perfectly. Yeah. I just think that it's it's such a cool company with such a cool story, and I like that they're always improving. It's not a if it ain't broke don't fix it. They're always tweaking and improving. Yeah, and you talk about like your legend, right? Mm-hmm. When you look at a boat, most people look at a bass boat and they don't notice what a bass boat salesman notices or a guy yeah. who looks at a lot of them, like yeah. those little components around the boat that fail. Yeah, ultimately. When you use your boat, boats are outside when we're, like, they're literally in the sun outside for eight hours. Yeah, so, mine, I didn't have indoor storage for it. It sat with the cover on it outside. Like, that thing got used and abused. Right. So when you put plastic and you put vinyl and you put cheaper, you know, less expensive yeah. components around, what happens to them? Oh, they, yeah. They wear. They weather. Yeah. Okay. Then what happens to that? Then when you resell it, 
it's less intact. Mm -hmm. It looks like it's in less good of shape. It makes it look cheaper, too. Correct. Yeah. It maybe doesn't look that way in the showroom brand new. No. But yeah. that's, I guess, what I like about Vexus, and that's what Ranger used to do. Yeah. That is the Ranger model. That's why the 2000... The, the 2007 to 2014 Rangers are just clean. Dude, it's it's a matter of, okay, we might be the most expensive right now, mm -hmm. but we also resell the most. Mm -hmm. If you're the most expensive and it doesn't resell the most expensive, yeah, you're just expensive. Yeah. But they're not the most expensive. That's, no. that's what's crazy. That's what's crazy. That's, that's, a, that's where I was going. You beat me there. Dude, I looked like, at Basscat prices the other dude, day. Dude, that's what I'm saying. Dude, Holy icons. Crap. Dude, like all of these other boats. There's, the icons are ridiculous. Oh, did you they're see They're all the new, the... over 100 grand. So what's you might the... as well get the one that's not going to fucking weather. Did you see the new all-electric bass boat that... Um, the this... Tesla? The Teslas? It. Uh... Oh, the one I developed on my spare time? <laughs> it's uh, the anti gravitational. I think it's like basketball? made by like Radian or something. It's a wake boat company. It goes 102 miles an hour. What? Yeah. And there's no motor. It's inboard, so it's all deck space. And it's got a dual single console to it, or a dual center console. How does it go 100? It's an electric brushless motor in it. It's like, you know how your trolling motors now go four miles an hour with the Quest series and the Lorances and the Garmin's because they're brushless? It's the same theory and concept for the outboard. Holy smokes. So your power per turn is higher so you can gain your speed more. When is, okay, when is that going to be a thing? Is that if coming? If you Google search electric bass boat right now, you'll be able to see it. Electric 100 mile an hour bass boat. It's the coolest concept bass boat I've ever seen besides the fact that it's electric. There was one that looked like that at the Blackfish Classic last year. Do you remember that center console? Yeah. Bass boat? I can't remember what that thing was. Yeah, that, that one. That had a racing outboard on it, yeah. though. That wasn't electric. No, but, that but, one is um, with the, all the sea deck on it. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. like a, that's a different deal. Yes. Yeah. That's a gas power. Mm -hmm. That's, that's like I a like custom kind of like. That's a weird fuck you money. Yeah. <laughs> this racing upward on it. Lurian. Yep, that's it. Turn that brightness up. Let's see that thing. She purdy. 200 mile range per charge. Yep. Tournament <laughs> mode 250 horsepower electric equivalent. God. Wide open mode 100 miles per hour. <laughs> Yeah. Boat length, 23 feet, 6 inches. 23? Ew, this thing's nuts. <laughs> Fishing surface, 170 square foot. <clears throat> yeah. Draft, 16 inches. Beam, 8 foot, 11 inches. Seating, 4 people. Jeez. Where, uh, okay. Tubing, not recommended. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you would die on that thing. <laughs> Insurance, expensive. <laughs> Dang it. Well, they don't let me see pictures very easily. What, where's the, where do I find the pictures, Waldo? I don't know where the pictures are on that thing. It's got to be... There's a ton of Google images of it, too. Just go, yeah, good thing, good thinking, image search. Oh, sh dude. What? Yeah. That cool? I've never seen anything like this. Yeah, dude. Got the full walkthrough. It's like all 100% deck space. Yeah, show that thing. Holy Jesus. What? Look at the starting price on it, too. 200 I think it's something like that. I don't. I didn't see a price on it, dude. What? The, it looks like it rides like a hay wagon. <laughs> it's flat. Yeah, it's. It, it looks like a flat bottom. Yeah. Oh I, wait, 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 wait. Never mind. I just seen something. Uh 
So the saltwater market, there's an engineer that patented this style of hull design. Mm -hmm. So any manufacturer that uses this hull bottom yeah. has to pay this guy a royalty yeah. of... Per hull, probably. Of fuck pile. Yeah. Yep. It's a probably lot. a percentage off of hulls. But you see... Yeah. Let me see if I can full screen that. See the indents? Yeah. In the bottom? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the saltwater market, that's a saltwater deal. Yeah. And that supposedly is like... Insane yeah, riding. That's what people want. Yeah. But any boat with this hull is going to cost more than every other boat without this hull. Yeah. So that's probably a so big I wonder, part, besides how expensive those lithium batteries are, because those are like just 40 grand themselves. It's such a strange concept, because I... Mm -hmm. I wish I was, a guy described it to me one time, but it was like a, two years ago. Yeah. So I'd, I'm going to be pretty rusty on trying to describe it. So just it. think all you would have sticking off the ass end of that thing are poles. Damn. Dude, this thing's wild. Yeah. I'm glad you told me about this. Yeah. L-U-R-I-O-N. Lurion. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like the Lorian. So they make, yeah, the DeLorean. <laughs> yeah. He's, yeah, exactly. Elon Musk, <laughs> Elon Musk R and D department, marine style. Yeah, it's it's wild. Um, I stumbled across that on uh, Jay Kumar posted about it like, oh, last okay. year. Got it. Yeah, I get That's his only, emails, but I don't read all of them. I do every once in a while, just for shits and giggles when I'm bored. I'll pop open one. There are a lot of good stuff in them too. Like what the frick? Yeah. So it's got that pitchfork front. Yeah, pickle fork. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, look at the front of that. Yeah, it's beefy. It's so weird. Yeah. Huh. But it's all deck space. Like, that's what I love about it. Like, Is that your elbow? Did it yeah. crack? Yeah. Oh, my God. So my elbow and shoulder are all screwed up from high school. I tore both my shoulders. So, like, whenever I hyperextend <coughs> my elbow, it, like, pops now. Oh. It's weird. Yeah, that's... I don't feel it. It just does it. It sounded painful. <laughs> they call it. They call it crappy elbow. <laughs> yeah, it's from. Uh, it's called stick it to demand. Too many Neosis. Too many hook sets. <laughs> just too flagging reeling. people. <laughs> too much reeling. So what do you think of Dane and I's new masterpiece? I with... love it, dude. That thing is sick. So what we're talking about, um, Dane's got a new signature series rod coming out. Which and, will uh, likely be out by the time you hear this podcast? Probably, yeah. For yeah. sure. It will be, yeah, by the time they, they, they hear it, yeah. And so someone to my left designed it, and it's it's badass. I mean, that, what, best tube rod ever? Tube, football jig. Anything with bottom the light, content. anything, yeah. yeah, anything you need to manipulate the bait with the rod on the bottom that has a larger profile, yeah, with a light to medium wire hook, yep. Where what the issue was that we wanted to fix was I could get a sensitive rod, but the rod that I like to drag and work the bait with mm -hmm. wasn't the same rod that I could land them with, yeah, if that makes sense, yeah. So I ended up going to a less sensitive rod, or like you crack the whip. You almost crack it too hard on those light wire, medium wire hooks. That, and when they hit it on the fall, after yeah. you crack the whip, you've got a slack line scenario, and, yeah. and you have, let's say it's a three-eighths or half-ounce football jig, and it's a small mouth. Yeah. And that that head, that fish has a head in its mouth. If you have too crisp or sensitive, like too yeah. fast of rod, too fast of when rod. you set, you pulling that, Big head out. You're pop. You're not you're popping your it. mouth open. Yeah. And if you hook the fish, it's on the. Out. You're not it's, snaring it or loading it. You're busting it out of its correct. mouth. Correct. Yep. Which yeah. might be good for your half ounce flipping jig. Yeah. Or whatever. But for the long cast, for the casting and dragging and pulling and popping yeah. and shaking. The distancing is huge on that. Right. Yeah. So it was like, okay, how do we get a rod with this action? You know, yeah. that little bit more delayed action. But when I drag the bait and I work it's, the bait, dude, that tip's so not that tip's not all over the place, you know? Yeah. And how do we make it like the most badass sensitive it's, freaking it's thing freaking you can sweet. do? Yeah. So it's friggin' sweet. That's gonna be 
I'm glad you approved. Cause oh, yeah. That's like, going to be a perfect 3 ace half-ounce tube jig rod right there. I mean, that's your, the bread only and, one. your bread and butter tube sizes, that thing's perfect for it. Same with your football jigs. I want to throw a small swing base. Swing, on that swing head. Yeah. Um, yeah, when you're throwing a, 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 that's what it's perfect for. Yep. Three to four inch bait. Yep. Half ounce football head. Moving. Moving or not moving. Yeah. Yep, but you don't want the delay towards the tip. You want yeah. the delay a third to, you know, halfway yeah. down. Plus, especially but you don't smallies. want the tip to be. They head shake and jump boink. so much. You don't want. Th- that's huge. That absorbs all of it. Yep. Yeah, that's that rod's gonna be a gangster rod to be throwing pretty much the entire summer. That rod with fourteen to sixteen pound fluorocarbon line and eight five to one reel is some Money. of the best sex you've ever had in your life. Yeah. Yeah, that thing is gonna be badass. I mean, you've been using it already though, so that, you can already say it is badass. That's I guess like so <laughs> that Dane and I yeah. we have these little projects that they'll sometimes take He'll build me something, and then he'll build me something else the next yeah. year, and it'll take me three, four years to maybe, like, dialed it in. But, yeah. like, he asked me, like, what do you want to come out with? I was like, dude, this is the most fit. Like, we worked hard on these. Yeah. And this is, he. I love so many rods he's built me, but that one is my most favoritest rod he's ever <laughs> built. That thing is so beautiful, dude. Ever. It's, it is badass. So... Yeah, honestly, when this comes out, people probably can touch them. Uh, yeah. I would say I already have limited series that are very similar to it, but Waypoint Angler Supply will have some. I'll have some. You'll have some in the Galaxy. They'll be they'll be all over the place to touch and feel and play with. Big thing is they're like this blank. It's it took a lot of testing to get to that blank. Yeah. And the blanks aren't like Amazon ship it overnight. Mm-hmm. So his first batch, it's going to be, when they're gone, they're gone. And yeah. then we got to order more. Yeah. And it might take a couple months, right? Yeah. So that's, I guess if you're listening, like, first If you first like batch, throwing a tube and you're a smallmouth nut, this would be one of those rods that, I mean, you can't fish without type thing. Dude, I, I'm getting, I need two, like. Yeah. Need two. Yeah, that's one of those and things And everybody where, needs one. I need two. Yeah. I, I love think that, Rod. The most fun. Well, that, how often do you have a football jig and a tube rigged up? That's. Because every spot's different. You one, always do. Every even day on the same different. the same day, the same lake, one spot, they're going on a tube. The next spot, oh, they're biting a football a little bit better. Or the Three football's. Three and a half. Or the Dang. football's coming through the rock better on a certain spot than a tube is. What I know is I want two sizes. Yeah. Of tube, or a tube and a football jig, yeah. or if they're on a football jig, I want two sizes. One with sizes. 14 pound, one with 16 pound. Yep. One with half, one with three ace. One with a rattle, one with, I mean. And that thing would be able to one handle One small all. purple, one green pumpkin, I mean, like. Yeah. Yeah, you need. Two. You need two. Yep, and then he makes a size down from it, right? So I had, in this series, in the series of testing and getting to that signature series, we figured out, and he. How many of those limited ones do you have left of that? Well, 36? those will be gone by the time this airs. I only have a few left right. of them. But people could pre-order those if they wanted, would you? It would take a couple of months because I bought the I bought all their inventory out, and so it would take a good three months to get the rods back in stock where I can build them. But that blank is perfect in money for any bait on a bait caster. Yeah. That's one eighth. To three A's. Yeah. So like, like a BFS quarter, system. Quarter ounce stupid tube. Yeah. Uh, it's the best. Like the size down is the best for that. It's a little faster. So that it's would a little be a faster. bread and butter dock rod then. It for well, I like quarter the, to three A's. I, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I like it for unpegged, like Texas rig. Yeah. You know that quarter yeah. five sixteenths. Yeah. When you're just blind casting around, not flipping into heavy shit. Eighth to quarter ounce tubes, and then like light finesse jigs, and then like a free rig. Shit, and I like, almost might like that one better because I like the lightweight stuff. Honestly, uh, how many do you have left, Dane? I think Three? I have two of the MBs left and one of the SJs left. I 
think. Okay. I have in the house. Chad Keller bought. I'll have to play. I have with it then. I have yeah. one at the studio, and I have three or four here. I have to have one for myself, right? So yeah. I think there's only two or three. I'm left. gonna have four or five of just those blanks. Yeah. Well, that makes sense because of how I fish. That's my so style. So you could throw lightweight swim jigs on it. My style is power finesse. And yeah. I, and yeah. The, when Dane and yep. I pursued the signature series. Power finesse is my power, favorite. We wanted to b- develop the best power finesse rod in the heavier category, you know, yeah. three eighths to three quarter. Mm-hmm. And uh, then he's got that limited run of that power finesse, yeah. you know, eighth to three eighths. Like yeah. magic. That's my favorite way to fish, dude. That'll be money. But yeah, dude, like when you think of rods, like it's all about specializing, in my opinion, yeah. now. Because every Joe, attention Joe, to detail. Every Joe Schmo, yeah, builds a seven foot medium head, like just your, yeah. Like it's some, probably generic. the most common bass fishing rod out there, seven mm-hmm. foot medium heavy, and it's the bread and butter rod. You can do everything on it. Every company makes generic rods. Nobody puts like category specific descriptions. Yeah, and you don't know if you're shopping online mm-hmm. what you're gonna get in that seven foot medium heavy man. Yep. Are you gonna get, uh, yeah. Most I can tell you what you're gonna get most of the time. It's gonna be a little too fast yep. for that application. There's only one company that I see that is actively doing something even similar to that besides you, Dane, and that's Dobbins, mm-hmm. where they have so many different blank lines for different applications and such. Sure. Yep. And that yep. would be I the wish closest m- thing to it. Yeah. But I wish more. Con- their even, descriptions are confusing though. No, and it's too w- vague. It's too wide of a wide of a variety of either weight sizes or um bait choices like they have a square bow rod that they also say chatter baits on but i i mean i would throw a completely different type of rod for a square bow than i would for a chatter bait so like it's just too vague and too wide of a range but they're the only ones that are like close to it this is way more fine-tuned way more technical so Especially smallmouth guys usually are fairly technical guys too. And we're really so, working on the description and being precise. And precision that's a, is huge. That's a big change this yeah. year for like breaking down the rods, being more, putting in more detail, mm-hmm. putting in more like this is a good starting spot, but this is the application that we use it for. Yeah. And you can build it stiffer and longer or softer and shorter, yeah. or you can like play around with it. And that's where the custom aspect comes in. But we're going to be launching more technique-specific rods mm-hmm. that have a much clearer idea of what you can do with it. Yeah. And everybody's different. So yeah. you can't appeal to 100% of the angler, but you can but give you can every get the angler. Majority. And well, you yeah. can get people that want to support. Yeah. They, you can tailor it to their liking. Mm-hmm. And they get that individual experience with yeah. me as a creator. Yeah. So here's so guess what the rod's going to be? The rod's going to be called the Puppet Master. Hell yeah. Yeah. Master of puppets and burning strength. Uh, but <laughs> one then, of the better metallic. So ones. this was the description I wrote because you won't find a description like in my opinion. Dane's like everybody likes something different, yeah. which is why I want to tell them exactly what this was designed for because I don't want somebody to buy this and thinking it's something yeah. different, right? So I'm gonna read this. This is the since since it's probably it's on available the website. Now, it's on the website. The description is. Oh, it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So don't read it? No, you totally can. Okay. Do I need to do it? Okay. The Aaron Teal Signature (laughs) Series Puppet Master was designed off years of testing in pursuit of the ultimate offshore power finesse bottom contact rod. Specifically focusing on an action that provides increased hookup ratio without compromising the sensitivity or crisp feel and control one would find with a $500 high modulus rod. While testing rods, we found that most actions are too fast and correct actions didn't provide enough sensitivity, feel, or control of the bait. Until the day we found it, the perfect blank with unmatched sensitivity and control and the perfect balance in action with strong backbone, parabolic fast taper, and the perfect tip delay for fishing bottom contact lures offshore. This was designed to be the best rod on planet Earth for quarter to half ounce football jigs, tubes, swing heads, casting jigs, stupid tube, etc. with a light to medium wire hook. 
This works best paired with a high speed ratio reel, 8 to 1 is preferred, and 12 to 18 pound fluorocarbon line, 14 to 16 being the sweet spot. When you take Veselka Fishing and Customs premium craftsmanship combined with the North Fork X-Ray Blank that we chose, quality guides, and components, you get the ultimate. Behold, the Puppet Master. Love it. That's awesome. So That but, is so but, specific but and yeah. straight to the point. Like yeah. It's perfect. It doesn't add in a whole bunch of BS, and it's so, it's so perfectly fine-tuned to... I mean, this is like it, it makes sense. They might find something else for it, but yeah. like nobody's doing that. Is no, what I'm saying. No nobody's one's doing that. Nobody's doing that. I've never seen a rod or heard of a rod description as where you can actually picture using these baits on it like that. That's what I yeah. I think cuz people buy online now. Yeah. And it's like how do you, it's it's much Dane, would you agree? Is it easier to sell a rod when you, they can bend it in front of you or over the phone online? For sure in person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I know Dane's done been doing some really cool shit with weighting and tapers. Yeah. So that you can show pictures of how the rod's going to load. Huge. So deflection so, graphs. So yep. in my yep. opinion, yep. Charts. Like between yep. deflection charts and like really good descriptions, yeah. that is what the rod market is missing. Yeah. And I guess I'm just super excited about Obviously, my rod, I'm really excited to try Ron's rod. Really excited to try Hayden's rod. And what, what did Hayden go with? Hayden's going with... <laughs> a 7 foot 3 medium fast. Ooh. To kind of... He has a rod that he's been using... Spinning or casting? Spinning. Oh, yeah. Pu puppet Master Spin. So, yeah. similar in taper almost, because I saw the deflection charts. Yeah. yeah. But spinning rod, lighter act, lighter backbone, so similar a taper, butter a kytec rod, butter any bottom so, contact yeah. spinning rod. That's gonna Ned, be nasty. Ned, Ned tube, tube, small swim baits. Darter. He he likes throwing oh, swim baits on it. That would be a money eerie darter rod. Yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. Mojo, I bet it'd be a good mojo. That would rod be a really good with, mojo rod. If it's any sort of parabolic, it's going to be a good mojo that, rod. It, yeah. 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 Wait until you see the taper on this thing. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna and the that. sensitivity with high, yeah. high quality stripper and spinning guides down to the recoil I'm be titanium. Up a reel this oh. next week for that rod, then, dude, it's so juicy. It's I don't so think so juicy. Speaking of reels, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you feel mass produced, big name, high end dollar rods, oh, yeah. and compare yeah. it to the one I have because I have a finished one downstairs. Okay. You can feel the weight and the sensitivity and the taper of the two side by side. One's two hundred dollars cheaper. Perfect. And you're like, how? Yeah. How is it? The yeah. higher quality guides and everything. How is it cheaper? Mm -hmm. You stupid Americans with you your NRX is spending too much money <laughs> on an R on a rod that's you Aren't know those like too much money. It's too much money. Holy shit. Spendy pocket. I think the most really expensive spendy. rod I ever purchased was like a a Dobbins Champion Extreme. Oh yes. yeah. That, and, Four or five hundred? Yeah, something like that. And I blew, I blew that thing up, like, probably two weeks into running it. Those rods were so sensitive, but they were too crisp. Oh, way too crisp. You Dude. could not slack line on those. I learned that the hard way. And uh, rods do that break. you can. So I, I thank Dobbins. I thank NRX. I oh, thank yeah. those companies because they allowed us to find the that, Puppet Master. The Puppet yep. Master. Yep. yep. That hey. rod's gonna be sick. I'm actually, I'm definitely gonna pick one up this year because it's badass. Well, most people bitch about problems, but we need problems, man. Oh yeah. If you don't got problems, you don't got nothing to solve. Yep. You don't got no purpose. Yep, and that solves my tube rod problem right there. Well, Dane's Although a, Dane I will say, I have, solver. I have one rod from Dane that is by far my favorite, and I've used and abused it so much. I need to bring it back to you to get a new guide because I was. Definitely aggressive with it, sliding it in and out of the rod locker a couple times. <laughs> and dude, that thing is so badass. I think you called it the Ray Charles. Oh yeah. Yeah. Wait, yeah. was that the big cast? He has a Ray Charles Junior version. Yeah. yeah. He has the same I, I rod think I as have you. That yeah. Rod. Well, That's yeah. Of course seven, you do. Yeah. 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 That thing is money. It's it, the gray one. Yeah. yeah. I I throw a lot of quarter ounce Kytex on that thing. Yeah. 
that rod is such a do everything rod for yeah. me. Dude, I got a titanium except DC on that thing. Except what we just talked about. Oh. That rod does everything for me except what we just talked about. It's a little yeah. crisp. other rods doing. Yeah. Yes. It's a little crisp. It's a little crisp for that. You know, yeah. a little bit. I like... Dude, it's a good flip. For, anything. Yeah. You can do anything with that swim jig. Really My favorite thing rod. to do on it is, yeah, swim jigs and Kitex on that rod because you can bomb with that thing. I think it's what, 7.5? Seven, 6.7.6. Six. Seven, six. It depends because that's such a rod. Rod companies don't have a standard for not only their tapers and actions, but their lengths. If you measure with the tape measure, a 7.3, sometimes it's 7.2.5, sometimes it's 7.3.5. If you take my 7.2 and measure it to a 7.3 from NRX, they're both exactly the same length. Mm-hmm. Mine, my, someone just bought a rod. Did you hear that? <laughs> that, that ka-ching. Puppet master. So, <laughs> that was How awesome. can we help that you? Was, that yeah, was perfect. Thank you. Let's Shopify. talk about fishing. Yeah. How can we help you? <laughs> someone just bought, we're not live or nothing. Someone just, are buying rods online. That's what that ka was. That's sick. That was perfect but, <laughs> timing. <laughs> my fingers hurt. <laughs> um, anyways. Most tournament anglers and guides are not covered fully or properly. Most insurance policies don't cover exposure due to tournaments and guiding. Taking the chance of using the wrong insurance gives the insurance company an out when settling a claim. How will the insurance company know that your fishing tournaments are guiding? Well, social media is their number one resource. And guess what? They use it. Lake Country Insurance offers one of the only products that can cover both tournament and guiding use in your vessel. Anglers don't seem to hesitate spending $50,000 to $100,000 for a boat. Why risk that large asset? All because you wanted to save a few extra shekels. Are you nuts? Call the folks at Lake Country Insurance today and make sure you have the proper coverage for your boat before the unexpected happens. Call 612-285-3113 today or visit their website, lcisagency.com. That's lcisagency.com. The, uh, so there's no standard, so a lot of times what you'll notice is you're like, oh, dude, it's a 7.4, I want a 7.4, but a 7.3 in one company is a 7.4 and da, da 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 So here's the problem that I have. There has to be a way to create a standard across rod manufacturing. And I'm going to start comparing and contrasting all the different brand, blanks, brands, and models so people can say, I have this brand in this blank and I want something custom built like this, but I need it to be slightly stiffer or slightly longer. So I can put these blanks on a deflection chart and compare and contrast them and have a library for people to utilize mm-hmm. what different specifications they can model up against. And then they'll be able to say, hey, here's the standard. Well, Selka Fishing has a map of the standard. Then you can go softer or stiffer, longer or shorter from there. Custom tailoring all of your rods and makes and models. And that's why the demo program is going to be so dope because people yeah. get to actually fish with it. Demo and they program? Can lo- oh, demo yeah. program. Demo program. Can you get to elaborate? The trailer that we're going to be living out of and fishing out of and building out of will be at all of the tournament trail events. Um, that are fairly nearby. Cabotogama, we probably won't bring the trailer up to, but um, I'll be able to offer demo rods where you can fish and rent these out at no cost. You just fill out paperwork in case you decide you want to steal it. Or break one? No, if you break one, you're not liable. I'm not going to charge you for broken rods. It's going to be all... Don't be a dick. Well, yeah, and if I'm fishing against you, I'm going to see you pre-tournament meeting and or tournament day. So you'll return the rod after you use it. Can't use them for tournaments, right? Because these um, are weapons, and I just don't—I don't think it's fair. (laughs) You got to pay to play for that. Yeah, for people to just be able to have a free weapon on Derby Day. Well, fuck that. Not allowed. We'll work through the process, but the biggest thing is I want you to be able to fish with it, feel with it, use it, test drive the car before you buy it. Mm -hmm. And no one does that. Only me. And. I'll have all the blanks, all the tapers, all the charts live in space, real time, so you get to actually compare and contrast. Yeah, that'll be dope. Dude, that'll be huge. It's so much easier to sell an order off of a demo rod, right? They can order rods. They can wait for them if they know it's what 
they want. Well, I'll have the blanks. I'll have the blanks in the trailer yeah. to build you know, there. I would rather like try out a rod and say I want it a little stiffer than this. Yep. But not as stiff as this one you let me try. Yep. And then talk and you through can the get guides the and all that perfect and knowing rod. that he's going to build it because yeah. he just saw exactly Cuz everyone everything. fishes baits a little differently too. So if you can get a perfect rod for the way you fish a specific bait, Shit, that's lethal right there. Well, and if you have a library of pictures that say, hey, man, this is the rod, what what would be slightly stiffer or faster than this rod? And you can just literally pull up the iPad, go through all the tapers and say, this one right here, see? Yeah. And then you can overlay the two tapers on top of each other so you can see the two blanks bending real time. Yeah. And I just photo overlay everything. Yeah, that's So huge. you can compare it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Dude, I'm telling you right now, that is sick. I'm so excited for that. That is like that'll be money. Yeah, it's game changing. Like it yeah. changes the experience, and I just it's, love nerding out about it. It gives you stuff. the ability to see what you're buying before you buy it, and to know exactly what the differences are between models. And it's the same thing with without, a vehicle. Well, without having yeah. it written down, like you get a visual with a specific weight mm-hmm. on the rod to see it. Well, that's what we did at Intune. You mentioned yeah. the vehicle thing. It's like. Well, when I was selling boats at Intune, it's like, how can we, I mean, these people are about to spend 70 plus thousand dollars on a boat. Yeah, it's a huge investment. You wouldn't buy a car without driving, you know? So that's what we did at Intune, and it was a huge success. Yeah. Imagine that. I do actually have, my dad actually brought up a really solid question the other day that I did not have an answer for. Why do they not lease boats, and why do they lease vehicles? Is it an insurance thing? That's a good question. So lease to me means rent to an extent. And there is a, Mm -hmm. they do, they do like your boat club. Mm -hmm. They only do leasing or rentals. So, but it's more of a membership thing. Yeah. Um, But they don't do it for fishing boats. And I know why. Yeah. Or fucking reckless. Yeah. True. Way too high. Because it wouldn't be profitable. But to that extent, they lease BMWs. They lease. Valid. I know if I'm driving a beamer, I'm going to be pretty freaking reckless. <laughs> but you're not going to take it through a stump field. No. There's going to be lines on a road. The worst you're going to take it down is gravel and hit a deer. Well, and when yeah. you lease a vehicle, you take care of it. Like, you maintain it and well, maintenance there's insurance it. like anything. Sure. Yeah. But you put tires on it when the tires go bad. Yep. You change the oil. Like, yep. those things aren't covered. You just Put like a, a new boat. prop on if you ding a, ding a rock. Great. Right. There could be something with that. That's what I I'm guess. saying. Like I'm, one, I was just wondering why nobody does it. There has to be a solid. Vegas, let's go in on this business. Yeah, yeah, dude. Uh, sp- people are hopefully refining right now, but Dagus. Not yet. Not yet. Dagus, uh, we we'd like to start a bass boat leasing agency, the biggest and the best. Yeah, we'd like to call it Supreme. Lending worldwide. Wide. 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 Last week we put liquid paper on a bee. It and died. It, and it died. <laughs> <laughs> Management. Financial portfolios. <laughs> Having the know how for what you need. Uh, dude, that, that, like, either we just thought of a million dollar idea or somebody's going to Zuckerberg that from us, but. One of the two. I'm glad, like, I don't know. I'm you, start, you just brought I'm it up the other day, and I was like, on I have no idea why they don't. I'm going to, like, because you, you could lease them. <laughs> you could lease them for six months up here in Minnesota. Yep. Yeah. From April till. And you don't pay for storage, and you don't need to worry about it, and you just get it. Because that's when people want to use their yeah. boat. And I wonder how effective how much more affordable it would be is the yeah you have thing. a decent sized compound that can store let's say 30 40 boats you've only got six months of payments versus 12 God, if you had like a really big pole barn you only have an six arena. months of if insurance like ho- payments if we knew somebody with like a horse arena yeah you could keep them all in there and, yeah. and cause a divorce with his wife because the horses can't roam in there anymore yeah trust me if i could make enough to build another arena building yeah. she'd be all for it <laughs> there we go Four arenas, quad. We call it the quadplex of Waverly, Minnesota. Yeah. There we go. I'm saying there Dude. might be something there. Yeah. 
Bonama, Dagus, you want in? I mean, you need do like a like a a split fee cost or something or something along the lines of that. Like there's there's so many things like the yes, initial fleet is the major purchase. Yeah, but you could scale it. You could start with a two boat fleet. Don't you right? think that Intune Marine could benefit it. off something like that? We talked about it, but we couldn't make. If I remember right, making the numbers work, but I just don't think we had enough time. Like, well, I think if you, you think about it, you'd really need to pursue it. Okay, what's focus. the average? It's all the numbers. What's the average numbers. boat payment right now? Five hundred bucks a month, six hundred bucks a month, seven hundred bucks a de- month. Depends on I mean, the down, d- payment, payment, right? down, down payment. Okay, let's call it. Let's call it six hundred dollars yeah, a month. Six hundred is a pretty good yeah. round number. Yeah. So if we call it six hundred dollars a month, theoretically, you've got six months of payment. Right. Yep. You're and you're married to it for a term that is six, cool. seven years. Let's, up or, to twenty. Up to twenty. Up to twenty. And for a lease though, a lot of times there there's two year and five year leases. Gotcha. For vehicles at least. Yep. yep. So you'd be making you gotta, you'd be now you gotta figure depreciation and everything else from there. Yeah. That's the hard part. That's because that you lose fifteen percent that first year, and then yeah. 10, and 10. I'm sure 10. the margins aren't there like they are with your boat vehicles. club does an auction with their boats when they're done with them. Yeah, I have a and buyout plan. That's what you do. Yeah. That's what they do. And I'll be honest, those are the most throttled pontoons. Yeah, I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, they are rough. Yeah. So your shit, like you it's have to figure, abused. you are selling those things in rough shape. Yeah. So it's how much can you make on rentals in the meantime to, I guess, to account for that depreciation. And then how good can you buy those fleets? Which yeah. the problem is, is I worked at a boat dealer. Yeah. People Margins think, aren't there. People think dealers make a lot of money and no. they have all these room and boats. Like, it's, nope. not, it's not the case. No. Okay? And it sucks. And there's not room in boats, but there's really not room in electronics. And they added 20 grand worth of them to the boat. Yeah. So, like, it really makes it challenging to me. I, I think it'd just be. I, th- I think it, it, it's I'm not very, good enough with numbers to know. No, you need a would really be... good numbers guy to see if that's feasible. Yeah. But I think you're onto something. I think there's something. It'd be there, a dude. very large initial investment for a very long term gain. Right, right. But so talk- that's probably why they don't do that, because especially since the margins just are not there. But <laughs> here's the thing. If there's a mandatory, you either have to re-sign a new lease or buy out the boat. You technically could potentially make more money. But like Dane said, you would have to factor depreciation into it. You're gonna, it's it's going to be, it's going to be, you're going to gonna sell the boat less for than what you bought it for. So, that so that how means- much can you make renting it out? That's what it boils That down must to. mean that for vehicles, just better margins are there then for them to justify doing Because you don't see I every... I don't think they do have better margin. I think their In margin what? is a lot smaller. Their profit margin... For what? On a vehicle, yeah, a vehicle versus, versus a boat. boat. Yeah, because they sell... So many. They, yeah, oh, it's yeah. super yeah, volume yeah. driven. Yeah. And then the manufacturers... Because everyone like needs a vehicle, end. not everyone needs a boat. Well, they make their money on financing yep, and back-end yeah. money. you got to think, like, when a dealership buys a fleet of boats, like, when they take the money out on those boats and they're paying on these boats, you know, the manufacturer is getting paid up front, right? Yeah. Well, no... So then the dealership is sitting on an amount of boats with allocated funds, and after so much time, you're paying a pile of interest on these boats. So yeah. Florida that's company. The, yeah, yep. yep. So that's the hard... Yeah, part. unless you've been biz- in business for a hundred years and you got house money, which is very rare. Yeah, yeah. you're playing with borrowed money already. Yeah, so which means interest. Which means that's what's tough yep. about the boat dealer game, and people don't understand that. It's it's uh, if you sit on inventory, whew, it costs you money a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, like, and money and floor space, dude. It's and, a tough business. Yeah. It's a really tough business because it's seasonal. So you have yeah. all your service work happens at once. So everybody's pissed off because the you got least this thing big would be a much time. greater benefit for the angler versus the dealer. One hundred percent, because 100%. the high school kid could rent the boat that's worth eighty thousand dollars in three years. And, yes. Yeah. 
but the parents... By par- working I mean, all winter long and then, then the fishing parents, all summer. The parents aren't locked into an $80,000 loan. They're locked into a three-year lease agreement. The yeah. insurance policy for that has to be insane. So for that it's one of those situations where the dealer lacks the benefit. It maybe isn't yeah. profitable enough is yeah. the only thing to be yeah. worthwhile. Right? Yeah. Because like a pontoon, get a pile of floating living rooms and slap yeah. them on the ass, call it good. But yeah. that guy figured it out. But... Getting back to like tangible stuff, Dane and I had a really fun conversation last night, like getting into the intricacies of hmm. Rod Blanks. And Yo. I guess Dane, I, I uh Fuck yeah. I uh, I, I ca- we kinda got off the train, but I kinda want yeah. you to like delve into this How? rod rod nerdery you've been exploring. Dude. It, there's a cosmos of cosmos. Yeah. When you when you look at how certain companies are creating their branks and they're using pre impreg rolls of carbon and epoxy, you know you you almost have to think about big sheets of of like reams of paper that are rolled out and cut into flags and rolled on a mandrel to get, get their shape. And each yeah. mandrel is its own like taper, and these flags are long triangles of carbon with pre impregnated resin. Like epoxy that's not been heated up and molded into the okay. carbons yeah. is there until you shape the blanks, you wrap them in tape, and you heat them up while they're hanging to melt the resin epoxy into the carbons. Yeah. And that's where you're getting different tapers, different materials, different okay. sensitivities. And when these blanks come out and they're untaped and unwrapped and cut and the tips are shaped and sanded, the amount of human error that can go into a blank manufacturing Manufacturing processes. I mean, you got to be on your game do when you a lot get, of this is done by do hand. You reject a lot of blanks. That I would say just... that I don't reject a lot of blanks. I just notice certain human errors. Yeah. yeah. And when we start talking about blanks, natural deflection, and spine, and where you put the guides, and how things are mapped out, every blank is very unique and has sometimes subtle unnatural tapers and the one thing that i was researching the other day is the argument on a blank's spine and rod or um, excuse me real seat and guide placement because some rods have a tendency to be very crisp and other rods have a tendency to be very limber and there can be arguments based on the fact of which direction the spine truly faces which way the blank naturally curves or bends and loads and putting the guides on the actual taper the more aggressive taper side versus the less aggressive taper side to natural or um to even out the um blanks tendency to to flex a certain direction now it sounds kind of complicated and goofy but what's a spine because a lot of people listening probably don't know what you mean when i know what you mean when you say spine of a blank but a lot of people might not know that a blank even has a spine, yeah. let alone what, what you mean by that. So, so just, when, sorry. Yeah, when these rods come out of their curing process and they're cut and they're sanded and they're kind of finished up, you got to imagine the blank shaped like an eyeball from the butt of the rod looking into the blank. They're hollow, right? you got to imagine an eyeball. So when you try and roll this blank, it wants to lay flat on the flat side of this almond shape or this eyeball. Right. Well, down that blank, you literally have, just like your yeah. back, yeah. it spine. has a spot down yep. the blank that's a spine. Yeah. If you will. If like you it's, will. Yeah. When, you, when you flex the rod under load and spin it with a They'll hand, roll. it'll yeah. lock into a place that's happy. But there's two, two sides to that blank. Yeah. Some will say it's the top, some will say it's the bottom. Mm-hmm. Well, if you put spinning guides on the bottom side of the blank, right, you're waiting the side of the rod that wants to naturally bend or deflect in that direction. Now, if you put the spinning guides on the other side, now you're fighting the rod's natural tendency to bend in a certain direction and you're evening out and you're crispening up that rod. So now it takes the same amount of pressure and resistance Mm -hmm. to bend it in either direction, which will help your deflection rate when you cast. Because if you have a rod that bends to to, to one side and you put blanks on that side of the blank, now it's loaded up on that side and it'll, that makes sense you yeah. know what i'm saying yeah. so when you start thinking about this shit and you start figuring out what side of the blank you want the guides or if you do want more of a moderate taper yeah. you can actually increase or decrease 
the, the action based on what side of the blank you're putting them on. Damn. Dude, like, down to, like... Yeah. And when you see it on a deflection chart, the same, the same bl blank. Yeah, that's then, where you notice then it. Then you can go, oh, fuck. Like, there are yeah. so many other variables that go into building these rods. So, and, like, one blank might be better casting rod than another blank? Or is it just simply based off of, I want this taper versus this taper? Okay. So, hair, that's what it is. The What made sense to me is the hair rod, because that rod <laughs> is, is, is a... You know, it's a whippy rod, right? But it doesn't whip through the handle, so, but, which is awesome. But he can make the rod when you cast, yeah, respond more tight and mm -hmm. straight, and get back to twelve o'clock the quickest, right? Yeah. Instead of going from, you know, ten o'clock to yeah. two o'clock for three seconds, it's going to from ten to two for a half a second, uh, eleven to one for a half a second, and it's back to midnight. Yeah, you know, yeah, you can really fine tune these builds this way, and that's you know sometimes people don't just don't need to know and don't <laughs> don't want to overthink it because yeah. they're like oh well what side of the blank are these guides on and does it really does it really matter at the end of the day it depends on how you're fishing it mm -hmm. and if you're casting plenty far does it really matter probably not yeah and is is what's the top or the bottom well there is no right answer just yeah. like what's medium heavy yeah. Well, you mentioned it. There, if we are fine tuning, though, yes, that's one way one... might get you more distance and more accuracy, right? If we're talking about a roll cast under a dock, that rod with the better deflection, like response rate, mm -hmm. is going to be a more true casting target shooting situation. Yeah, and then that same thing allows it to cast further because there's less resistance. Yeah, on the guides on on your follow through, yeah. right? But for most people, how many how many yards are we talking in your casting distance, right? We're talking finite, right? Finite things. Was it windy? And Was it not windy? What kind of line? You know, are you how using? many yeah. inches within the left or Even the right of that little dock? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Totally. Yeah. So, I do like it's like oh yeah no nope, I like thirty five blue flakes in my freaking tube like. You'll probably catch just as many with 28 flakes, but... But, bro, in the yeah. fishing industry, you have to remember that there are a lot it's more confident. nuts. There's a lot more nut-type people that are yeah. into that shit. So, again, here's the difference. You can't go somewhere and say, yo, man, I don't like this rod because of this reason, and have it swapped out and have it returned and switched and rebuilt differently. Like, if it's not offered, it's not offered. Yeah. Like if you buy a custom rod and you're like, yo, dude, Teal Signature Rod is just, it's too stiff for me still, or mm -hmm. it's too soft for me still. Well, cool. Here, I'll take it back. You've had it for a month. You've been fishing with it. I'll take it back. I'll build you this one. It's softer and it's an even switch. Like mm -hmm. those are the things that people need to keep in mind that it's not just here, take, take the rod. Oh, you don't like it. Oh, it goes in the bottom of the rod locker. No, dude, bring it back. Let's 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 do it right. Let's let's change it up. Let's put the guides on the other side, or let's pick the blank that's slightly more moderate, or let's work with you and make sure that you like what you got because it's not cheap, dude. In my opinion, it it's a matter of, like what where you come in is to mitigate your weaknesses and enhance your strengths, right? Yeah. So that is when you start to talk about these things, like with Dane. It's a matter of. Okay, I have this technique I'm super intimate with, right? It's a power finesse technique. Yeah. And how you doing? I'm good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> He's only been blasted for the last few hours, just getting his arm yeah, completely I forget. Like, obliterated. Yeah, I haven't even seen a tear. No, I love this. I could fall asleep. Keep, right keep now. going, Teal. But we were talking about like he's super intimate with his confidence techniques to the point where, like those minute details of mm -hmm. a rod. You can speak to those, right? Yeah. Versus a technique you you haven't done as much. Mm -hmm. Now we're overthinking things because you don't know the technique well enough to know, like, right? Some well, of those finer yeah. details. And that's the difference between, like, I have 50 different types of mass-produced rods. All different brands just because I found one that I really like. But with this, you don't need to have 100 different brands. Right. It's all under one. Well, and you that, certainly, that crazy? And you certainly I was can. the same way. Yeah. 
I had a hodgepodge because of that. Oh, yeah. I mean, you would have Shimano Kamara rods. Yep. You would have a couple Loomis's. Yep. And then you would have a handful Dobbins, of Dobbins. Uh, um, Arc. I got a couple yeah, of Arcs. I got yeah. a Kistler. I have, like, a Ducket rod. that I love. Like, yeah. there's there's a bunch of different ones. I have a couple old uh, RC Rapala rods that were dope. Like, Dude, I have a couple favorite rods that I use for blade baits that, yeah. I'm, that I've been testing for him to make and improve upon. Yeah, like, exactly. Dave, so, you know what I'm talking about. That's what's dope yeah. about this is you don't need to do that anymore when you can get it even more fine-tuned and perfect for the way that you fish all under one roof. The big thing with Dane, though, out of respect for Dane, is like people need to understand you can't these you can't find a more time. analytical guy. These when it things comes take down to time rocks. too. So yeah. it's like you like one year at a time we come out with something new and different and better, right? I would say Dane's coming out with you know, six new things. Like that's all a guy can really Yeah. Beside besides individual stuff, like it's a you can get way too in the weeds, way overthink oh, yeah. it. There's certain yeah. techniques that it seems like you do need to fine tune. Oh, and then a weakness would be throwing a light bait far, right? That'd be another. We were yeah. talking about enhancing strengths, but also clear weaknesses, right? That distance mm -hmm. thing with the hair jig rod. That that's that was huge. A weak the difference and for me, that distance thing with the hair jig is is a big deal because that can affect you know how fast you tow. It can be a huge effect on um how much distance you cover and how many more casts you have to make to cover a rock spine. Like, and on the record, I am so willing for constructive criticism, like willing to receive suggestions, like always willing yeah. to build upon and improve on what we think is great and what has changed certain preferences yeah. in the industry. That by no means is this the one all be all, and I no, don't have it all right. figured out. Like, yeah. let's make that plenty and plus clear. Everyone fishes Nobody differently. Has it all yes, everyone fishes differently too. My intent and my goal is to make sure that I continue to redevelop. I continue to redevelop these things to make sure that people's problems are answered and fixed. That is the goal. That is the business model. It's yeah. to literally help people. It's to make it easier. It's mm -hmm. to help you fine tune your application. So I got to be careful with how we talk about certain things because it does make it seem like, oh, uh, you know, it's it's the best. It's the only. It's the, yeah. Because well, the way Teal and I fish a tube, so that's the would big be thing. completely different than someone else fishing a yes. tube, and yes. that's why like yes. this is just a suggestion. That's why my description was so specific, detailed, mm -hmm. yeah. is because I needed people to know this is for a light to meteor wire hook yeah this is not for a flipping hook yeah. on a football jig on yeah. a three-quarter ounce football jig that yeah. is a different rod yeah okay and just like so we each have different strengths right yeah i don't know how to design a chicken and chatterbait rod because i'm not a professional chicken and chatterbait fisherman yeah. but when paul newman who's really good at both of those techniques yeah. is spending time with Dane to develop the perfect one. It, it goes listen. a long way. I listen, right? Yeah. So it's like now I'm in love with that rod because Dane listened to an expert on that. Dane's not an expert chatterbait or chicken or either, but mm -hmm. he's yeah. an expert rod builder. Yeah. So what I like about him and some of these rods he's come out with it's the is, is he's, yeah. he's going to the guy yeah. who spent the most time and got the most intimate with that technique. And yeah. I would say, like, the hair jig rod is something him and I developed together. Mm -hmm. The tube rod, I'm super intimate with that yeah. style of technique. So he listened to me on that, mm -hmm. and now we've got that, right? Hayden's super good, good with the spinning pole. Yep. So it's like, I'm, I'm as excited about these rods he's working with other people on as I am about, you know, the ones him and I are working on. Yeah. There's and a level of humility that needs to be there because you have to take what you think you know and be able to readjust it. Yeah. And tr and then build it and try it. Yeah. That it's very hard to do because I don't like <laughs> I don't like being told what to do. Mm -hmm. And I and I've been self-employed for a long time, so there there's been a learning curve there with okay, I am doing this wrong here. Mm -hmm. How can I make it better? Take 
advice from five different people, reapply it. Okay, and I'll try this. Yep. Are you going to buy a spinning rod from Keith Combs? No. 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 <laughs> but I'll buy one from Taco I Eat. Yeah, yeah. That's so, like, and that's what I do like about you, Dane, is you are a humble person. And I think that it's really easy to, if you build a product, to be so yeah. proud, proud of it. Yeah. That there's an ego behind it where you're not willing to yeah. change it, and that's or to to even like open up your mind to think that there's blind spots that you're yeah. missing something. And I love it when companies do that, where instead of having like a Jacob Wheeler line of rods, Daiwa did that deal with their Tatula Elites, yeah, where they had okay, Seth, you're the hair jig guy, let's make a hair jig rod. They or, figured out how to break the guides on all of those too. Oh yeah, they did. <laughs> <laughs> you fixed mine. I know you fixed. I know you fixed a lot of silver tatulas, Dane. Yeah, those are super light guides, though. Super yeah, and they're so rigid. Super light. Anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, but that, that's kind of what he's doing here, but on even another level. Yeah, not built by slaves in America. <sighs> here we go again with the slaves, dude. People don't think about it. Are we just not allowed to talk about? Oh, people like to know where their beef's from. Is this grass-fed beef? Is this grass-fed beef? Are these free-range raised chickens? Are these... <laughs> these aren't caged chickens, are they? People won't even buy a caged fucking chicken, Dane. Ro not even a rotisserie caged chicken. That is a slave chicken in I their mind. I love rotisserie like chicken. Hey guys, Gaff with Waypoint English Supply here. Just wanted to highlight the fact that we have the big bass resource right here. Obviously, everybody in Minnesota knows about Kytex and the little or swim baits like these bait labs here, but we're here to have the big baits here in the store. We got Huddleston's, we've got the dangerous swim baits, the jointed claw glide baits, and the bull shooter glide baits, but it's not only the baits. We've got big rods, big reels, big line, and all that good stuff for you guys to go ahead and chase your biggest fish of your life. So swing on into Waypoint English Supply and get hooked up with the biggest tackle around. My view on that, it all ends up in the same damn place. Well, sometimes we don't have a choice. No. Right? And I'm not talking about that, but we are talking about a choice right now. Mm -hmm. Like, I do want to bring up that point. Yeah. Because if you have the choice, oh, I'm gonna why wouldn't you buy from, here. Uh, from America? Mm -hmm. American made. Yep. Yep. I'd rather fill up my truck from American fuel. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd rather... Yeah. I run Mercury engine. So it's, it's made in Merca. Kind of related, not related. What yeah. what what application or what technique specific way of fishing doesn't have a rod specific to that design? I've noticed there's very few Bugs. glide bait rods. Like specific glide Bugs. bait rods. Like it seems like that your big swim bait rod is sick. And it's just a matter of figuring out the perfect rod that can sling a four ounce bait, a quarter pound bait. So let's say an eighth to a quarter pound now. Let's mm -hmm. say a two to six ounce bait and have chicken like hookup ratio and moderate like taper. That is so hard to do with mm -hmm. that heavy. A bait with treble hooks. You should talk right? to... Um, you. I love the one he made for me for Chad Chads and then that, that uh, beast For hook. me, it's those micro baits. I, I've i gone through so many different rods, and it'll be like, oh, I like this aspect of it, but it's not perfect for the rest of the aspects of fishing those bug baits. There is. I agree with that, So, actually. can like, you give me an example? Like what? The, are, what are, the one rod that I absolutely love is no longer made. Is the Tatula? It, it can be. It's it can the Tatula six eleven drop shot rod that they had right when they came out with the die with Tatula rods, where it's like it had that carbon wrap blank, but then it had an extra, extra, extra fast like needle ah, ice rod tip. Dude, like okay. my old Kumara. Yeah. Like, dude. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. Like that one, I actually loved because you didn't need to set the hook hard. It was more of just a a, a lift and reel. Because that little tip would immediately kick into backbone. Sure. You're talking about a pretty light drop shot rod. 
basically. Yeah. It's still yeah. a medium light light. It just had it had the, the backbone. It's crazy soft. It's so kinda, you can yeah. shake the slack. But it probably it still had a three eighth ounce rating. It yeah. just had a really sensitive Ooh. noodle tip. See yeah. buggy bait, I don't think I want it. Three eighth ounce. Rating. No, it was. Uh, I feel like it was I want, a three thirty second ounce. Rating. I feel it like was, I it want, was light. I feel like you want this kind of tip, but when it was this, literally a but this rod. kind of, like it bends down, but it's got so like, like a, a two part like bend a to power it. noodle or like a like a bass kang noodle. Like yeah. it, it was a noodle rod. Sure, as long as it has the really fast tip, but then it still has a parabolic backbone under yeah. extreme load. A yeah. secondary. Yeah. Yep. Ba- yep. That's what it I was. Meant it was a this. double backbone. Yep. Sure. That's yep. what it was. Sure. You got. Well, wrist, elbow, wrist, yeah, yeah. wrist, elbow. Yeah. It's got a wrist and an elbow. Yeah. Yeah. That was the one that I freaking just. Okay, hold on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it was, and I'm so sad when I broke it. It was one of my favorite rods for those micro baits. But the problem is they made the wrist not strong enough. Mm-hmm. So it would break at the wrist Dang because the, wrist. the elbow was too strong. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the problem with Dana. You t- you told me about that. The thinner the tip, the easier it is. Yeah, a lot of these really fast tapers, and they get a really fine-tuned tip. They're brittle, man. Like, mm-hmm. you stick them into a rod sleeve, Goofy, or you try yeah. and hook, up, hook a bait on the I couldn't the use keep- a rod sleeve on it, and I could not put it in my <laughs> rod locker. It stayed yeah. on the deck you, constantly. you got to be careful with that stuff. Like, there can't be rushing it and just slamming it into a rod locker or, you know, catching it on your sleeve when you're loading it into something because it J-hooks the tip so easy, and it really yeah. doesn't even have to J-hook. It just has to have pressure coming directly back, and it'll blow between the second and third guide like yep. it'll blow really fast four inches down yeah that's the problem with those i went through quite a few of them but they were so good with those micro baits so like throwing like even 30 sec, like 132nd ounces um 116th ounces it was it was dynamite for yeah the the rods i have for my micro baits right mm-hmm. now i don't have an issue hooking fish with them mm-hmm it's they're too spongy to like they're too moderate yeah. to cast them good. Yeah, like I need it a little bit more fat, like a little for more accuracy. Tip. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, yep. Because a lot of times when I'm doing those micro baits, I'm pinpointing casts because I'm either sharpshooting mm. with them, I'm either using the forward facing or like I'm a lax. I need it to be perfectly falling along the rock spine to hit sand, and I want it to be on that edge. So would this be considered like a live scoping rod, like a sh- straight up? Sh- yeah, 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 like yeah, yeah. Hover rig, Probably. hover rig. So that's yeah. what it is, dude. It's a hover rig rod. I yeah. would make it it's a sharp shooting rod. Yeah, I would make it in six six and six eleven. Yeah, six eleven is my favorite, dude, because it's it's long enough to where if I need to make a sixty seventy eighty foot cast to a to a fish, yep, you I can. can do that. But you it's don't also miss them sh- at forty. Yeah. And you really don't miss them at 40. Yeah. It's a precision rod. I was talking to a walleye pro, Tom Wynn. Yep. Oh, yeah. Good scoper. Oh, yeah. yeah. At that last boat show? Yep, yeah. at the at the boat show. And uh, I was just asking him about scoping rods because I was like, no one really makes like a mm-hmm. scoping specific rod. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> so that's our project Yeah. coming up. But That'll he was sick. saying he likes a six-foot light. Six foot I scope light. so much, it's unbelievable. Like, especially now ice fishing, it's it's insane how much I, I use it now and how much you learn from it. Like, Dude. I started dabbling with, like, shallow rock spines a long time ago. And the shallow rock spine deal with the scope is wild. Because you now learn how that same school of fish will utilize a, a bump out that's 10 feet. Little one. And, and a little bump out. And they'll go back and forth on it. Back and forth. And you can pinpoint your cast to each side of a bump out. Like, it's insane. Like that one spot where Big Red and I always whack them on the lax, that's that deal. It's a tiny little bump out. Dane's just... whacked them there too, I think. One time. Yeah. One time and I knew you weren't fishing. It's 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 the deal. Wait, wait, which which which? We aren't gonna say where it's at on Mille Lacs. Oh yeah, yep. With it was six years ago. The northwest quarter of the lake. Yeah, yeah. Six years ago. Yep. Don't. So Tom it's... Wynn, what was crazy to me about the scoping, his scoping situation is it was like golf. 
Okay. It's like he had a putter, a sand wedge, or a yeah. pitching wedge, and a nine iron. And yeah. each of his rods had a specific purpose, and it was to land on the walleye's nose at, yeah. at different distances yeah. on his live scope. Yeah. And he said, certain he's lengths got a are rod. way more accurate at certain distances. Oh, yeah. And this guy's good enough where he like, can tell you how big the walleye is, if it's a walleye yeah. or a drum. Like He's really good and yeah. in tune. And uh, he said, like, we think we're putting a bait on a fish's nose because we can see the lure and we can see the fish. Mm-hmm. But he's like, you might not be on his nose. Mm-hmm. He said he's figured out that beam width mm-hmm. and how to figure out Cause it's where the fish's to... nose is within that thing. Yeah, because like the worst thing you can ever do on forward facing is when you identify a fish target. The worst thing you can do is assume that the fish target is straight right there. You have to flex. The, you have to to shift your transducer to find your sweet spot of signal strength. So wherever you find the greatest amount of signal strength, that is going to be where the fish is true center on the cone. Yeah. Just because you see the fish doesn't mean it's true center on the cone. So then once you find that out, then you look at the direction the fish is shifted because that's how you figure out where the face of the fish is and Dude. needing to know if you need to cast further or closer. It's so crazy you say that because Tuma and I were just – talking about it on the last podcast he was explaining how patrick walters is really good with live scope when mm-hmm. he was fishing with them with these micro pans yeah and that makes perfect sense with yeah. these intimate you're live you're making scopers. one to two inch shifts with your transducer because a one to two inch shift is a two to four foot shift at 40 feet right it's like hitting the target with your bow versus hitting the bullseye yes yeah it's exactly that and rod being able to when you do your thing mm-hmm. to have the bait go where you want it to go. When Perfectly. you shoot your bow, yeah. wanting the arrow to go exactly to the I'm not going to use the same rod if a fish is 20 foot away versus if a fish is 30, 50 feet away. That to me blows my mind why the world isn't talking about that because mm-hmm. now we're talking bow hunting. It's about yeah, you're hitting sharp shooting. the bullseye, not yeah. the target. It's yeah. about hitting the heart, not the the hindquarters. Yeah, it's you're, about... you're sharp shooting a fish. And so even different fish... Brands of forward-facing sonar have different cone angle tolerances too. Yeah, or like frisbee golf. Yeah, like the good frisbee golfers, they you know bring two joints and eight golf discs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. they all have different yeah purposes. Yeah, it's it's mental when you really break down those intricacies, and so having that perfect rod is huge. Because like an arrow or a frisbee golf disc, you don't need to reel it in. Yeah, it's all about landing it right yeah and rods i guess we think about all these things but yeah truly tart shooting live scope with a rod nobody's yeah. marketing that nobody's and nobody's the other thing is really after that i use different Maybe lines for different distances so like for my longer range sharp shoots i use a uh, shorter leader more braid because mm. i can cast yep. it further yep. more precisely yep my close up 20 foot and under sharp shoot rod I'm almost using straight floral or oh, straight copal. It's that long a leader. Yeah. Like you don't even get to your braid. I don't even get to my braid because it flows better off the reel. It wants to come off the It spool. wants to come off the spool. Yeah. So it, there's less resistance from the rod. There's less resistance on the bait falling. Bet yeah. you didn't think of that. <laughs> <laughs> well. No, I think about a lot of things. It's just, did I remember to think about that the right way? And I'm learning, dude. This scoping thing, I, I'm i late to the party. So I'm just, like, we, when I well, talk to nice Father me, Gill, I when I talk to Wynn, yeah. and talking to you. I use it all year, especially ice fishing. What have you learned about scope? Oh. And we're we're getting to the point where we probably need to close out at some point soon. Yeah. But. I think the biggest thing is, is the width thing of their cone angle. You've got two cones. Tech, well, there's a lot more going on with the transducers than people realize. But you've got. You've got a width factor to the cone. It's 120 degrees by 20 degrees, which is the standard for most of the forward facings. Yep. So at 40 foot, you have to look at 20 degrees. You're covering 12 feet. Wide. Wide. 12 feet wide. At At 80 foot, you're almost 20 feet wide. When you move your... Transducer. When you move it. Yep. So it's all based off cone angles. I well, can what send if you, you don't chart. move it and it's straight? I have straight. a chart. If you don't move it, what are we talking? It's still the same. It's still well, the same. Yeah, yeah right. it's still the same. That's crazy. But your signal strength of fish 
the brighter your signal strength and the stronger your signal strength, the closer to do center it is. <laughs> so I have a cone angle chart from working at Vex that I know my distances of widths. So at like a hundred foot of water, my cone angle is like 25 foot wide. Mm-hmm. So Same when you're, theory yep, for yep, going yep. outwards. No, I I I, I knew it well, got wider as you go out. I just didn't know it was twelve feet wide at eighty to hundred feet. That's cool. It's insane. Yeah. So understanding that and making those micro movements with the live to get the exact width line because everyone thinks, oh, my trolling motor is pointing that way. That fish is right there. Well, that fish could be on the right or left side of yeah, that. Cone. Ten feet left to where you're pointing. Ten feet left to where you're pointing. Uh. Live scoping, so it's so easy. That's we should where, yeah, exactly. just like there? your Vexlar, yeah. that's where they need a low power mode to reduce their cone angle to make it more of a knife, mm-hmm. where you can really like, okay, here's the fish, and yeah. then you can turn yeah. the low voltage yeah. on and narrow it down, and then you can go, wait, it's right there. Yeah, like just that's, yeah, that's how you get your specifics. Because that's one thing we've really learned is, oh, the fish is on forward facing. You see the auger punch land directly on top of the fish you drop your vex on you don't see the fish and you're like what the fuck yeah take three more steps over here and drill here yeah it's same distance but laterally move yeah and that's where the fish is that's why those micro movements with the forward facing is so huge because you get to dial in the exact center of cone for sure so having your sensitivity at a lower level but your color line at a higher level so you can see the color flare easier when it is in true center is more important and being able to have lower sensitivity so that you only see that fish when it is true center you might see less information you might have a harder time seeing your bait but you have an easier time of telling where that fish is within laterally within the cone is more important to pinpoint casts for sure which is why you need more than one live scope on your boat yes and also (laughs) why you need more than one because then you have one set to a certain Distance, distance and width and then a narrowing down the mm-hmm. yeah and it's funny because father gil told me that he would have two mm-hmm. and it's funny the really good scopers they like to scope 80 feet and in and based on what we just talked about mm-hmm. i know exactly why it's it's tom lateral. win when it's, i was talking to him he's yeah. like i prefer to scope 40 feet and less yeah same and i was like god that's close mm-hmm. you don't cast at them till they're there no i position the boat yeah. So that far one's for positioning, right? Yep. For sneaking up downwind of that deer before you line up your shot. Yeah. Oh, the there buck has is. just moved in for the rut. Oh, Arm he, up. he just stopped. Oh, he Hold turned. It. Hold it. Now I shoot. Yeah. Now I shoot. Mm-hmm. Dude, that's crazy. Yeah, it, it's, it's wild. There's a lot of intricacies that people just overlook. With the forward it's facing. It's easy to do. A lot of It's super easy to do. Yeah. Well, yeah, you just want to go out and point the damn thing and cast at the first blip. Yeah. Those guys don't cast till they see one they want their live well, the really good ones. Yeah, and the most important part about that is when you are sharpshooting because that's the difference of making 20 casts at a fish to get it in the perfect position yeah, versus or two. two. Yeah. And being more efficient with your time because that's... That's the biggest thing with the guys that are really good at forward facing. They're very efficient with it. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yep. It's the difference of catching 30 fish in four hours versus catching 10 fish in four hours. It's all about your efficiency with it. Right, right. What have you learned about spooking stuff and how fish respond to the sonar? Have you noticed that? A lot. Yeah. Is it the auger or is it the sonar? Uh, a lot of times it's the sonar because we won't even get a chance to drill a hole. Really? Yeah. So, but here's the thing: it, I've noticed it being a huge factor on certain days on certain lakes, and I've seen it not be a factor. So, it's all situational. It's yep. not like a rule of thumb by any means. There's no definite answer for it. Do you think they get conditioned to it, though? Yeah, they yeah. will get conditioned to it, and you'll see a school, like, if you're beating the shit out of a school, and you'll see the school shift, and then you get closer without even catching one, and they shift again. Like, you'll you'll notice little intricacies about that, but it's just a... It's just one of those things to be mindful of, is if you do notice it moving fish. Like, from what I've seen, 
when fish are conditioned to it, it's like a 30-foot rule. And you will notice schools move now, whether it's the noise coming from the trolling motor or your outboard. I think a lot of it is to do with the sonar pinging, especially with the forward facing because it's hitting the lateral line horizontally. Mm -hmm. So it all depends because there's been certain fisheries that I've gone to that I know that there is nobody that's using forward facing on and they're, they feel it and they move. And then there's other fisheries, like let's say Minnetonka, for an example, I can get directly on top of the fish and just drop right on it and it's, do you think it's because they're so used to it? It could be that like they're that so used to it. It's, yeah. it's like they've felt that before versus yeah. like all of a sudden. I noticed that with spawning fish on vermilion, it mm-hmm. almost seemed like they were a little harder to catch. Yeah. Um, but like. There's it, just, it's just one of those things where. If you've never seen a bear before, yeah. you're going to be pretty scared, right? Yeah. But if you see enough bears and you kind of know. You've you become know, conditioned to be, it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So but that is so weird. That, but the thing with that is though. I have noticed that there have been times where I can get directly on top of fish with it, but I can't get them to bite. Uh, but they don't leave. They, they just don't, don't leave. Bite. They just don't bite. And I've noticed the exact opposite, where they're flying around like crazy, and, and you feel like you're pushing them, and then you finally get in front of one's face, and it eats immediately. Maybe they're just flying around eating zooplankton. Exactly. So, there's... <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I don't think they have oh, to move that sir, whale. <laughs> I speak whale. Yeah. So there there's that. I feel like it affects them, but I don't feel like it's as important as people think. I just think they need to be mindful of it and if they notice that it's a specific day where they can't get within thirty feet of fish, stay forty, fifty feet away, use that longer rod. Yeah. And make a more pinpoint cast at a further distance. Dude, do you want a beer? I would love a beer. Okay. Do you we want... are five minutes from being done with his arm today. Perfect. Uh, can he have a beer for the last five minutes to for celebrate? Sure can. Okay. Hell yeah. And then uh, while I'm grabbing a beer, I want to talk about what crappies do in the summertime based on different weather and different water know. clarity. You don't know. I don't fish for them in the summer. Dang it. <laughs> I fish bass in the summer. Dang it. Yeah. See, I, I wanted to use your crappie knowledge to... You know, piggyback I do my bass all winter and office. spring for crappies, and then all summer and fall. Well, all summer and fall, it's primarily smallmouth. Do you want a light beer or a stout? Surprise me. Well, it's too different. I know. So it's I'm, a local brewery, Cold Spring or Third Street Brewery in Cold Spring. I love them all. Beer is beer for me. I'm in the middle of that program that i did last year that 75 hard no beer for me today yep i'm halfway through it i'll keep on going sugar shack or minnesota gold light? minnesota gold light that looks that looks really good it is very good i'm gonna have this sugar shack maple stout <laughs> so yeah this is the beer small town brewery in cold spring it's been there for like over 100 years used to be glick yep used to be glick and cold spring brewery but um, yeah, so, like, that's, like, their standard light beer. That's yeah. really good. Or, like, crispy. And mc- that's really good. I like and, that one a lot. And then this one's, like, it's called Sugar Shack. So, you know St. John's University? Yeah. So, they use the maple syrup from St. John's University in the Sugar Shack. Damn. So, yeah, it's kind of, like, a cool story with it. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not a stout guy. Yeah. I don't like stouts historically, but this maple stout... The sugar shack. I mean, for me, I oh, like we stouts. Got, we got tornadoes on the screen, dude. That's right. You're a storm I chaser. You're a storm chaser. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh my god. Okay. So you're kind of a weather expert. I love it. Bugs, weather, you name it. Fish. All the weird shit. You're a weird guy, Ace. Yeah. Dude, I love that's the so weird good. shit. We're yeah. all on a spectrum. I'm on a crackhead fishing spectrum that is different than yours, but I love fellow crackhead fishing spectrum folk yeah yeah my favorite thing to do besides fishing or hunting is storm chasing i absolutely love it feel like it's dangerous or anticlimactic but not both it <laughs> it can be both actually to be honest with you like especially when we're doing our out-of-state chases like you go so early to all you so pretty much how we do it 
we get ourselves into the general storm risk area. So if it's a moderate risk, it's a moderate risk. And No, don't go to the fire. <laughs> And then once, yeah. And then once we see how the weather go is towards the flames, don't go towards the flame. So once we get towards the general area that we know that storms are going to fire, we stay off of them a little bit until we see how the the storms are lying out, how the fronts lying, um, where the dry line is, where the best humidity is, um, and then we we use those live weather maps to then hyper tune our positioning for the storms to develop your boat positioning. Exactly. It's extremely like fishing. Like my bass boat is my truck at that circumstance. Have you seen my truck set up? I have dual 12 inch iPads running with multiple oh, different I types of radar. Picture of that. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. So you got like Dakota lithium self the ass. Yeah, yeah. dog. <laughs> Yeah, do you got like radar out the top? You scoping them storms? Yeah, I'm scoping them with the uh, two. There's radar omega and radar scope. Yeah, he's not kidding. Yeah. No, I know he's not. Yeah. I'm just loving it. Yeah, and then there's NATO cast, which is a tornado specific weather model system. It's um, hasn't gone official with NOAA yet, but we use that quite a bit. N O A A. Um, yeah, and then we use like a lot of mesonet readings from. Um, there's like different weather stations. There's mobile weather stations as well on some people's vehicles. I haven't gotten that crazy into it, but it we we use a ton of different uh, radar tools um, and just weather modeling to do this. It's it's everything that the meteorologists use at weather stations. That's what we're using. It's it's pretty wild, like Dude. my my one of my really close friends, Sean Reesgraf, and I do. I mean, a shitload of storm chasing together, and we go, I mean, South Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin. We go all over. So they have, like, kind of like hurricanes. You've got, like, your Category 7, Category 2, Category 5. And they name the hurricanes, too. Yeah. That's not where I was going with it, but tornadoes, similar deal. Yep. There's different. Oh, yeah. Tornadoes are kind of your bag baby. Like, kind of, that's your baby is tornadoes. Do you that's... have a favorite type of... Dangerous weather that you like to study? Uh, tornadoes. That's my favorite. It's the adrenaline rush getting up close to them and feeling raw power that you have zero control over. Okay, it's so like, there has to be some sort of childhood experience that sparked... Oh, 100%. Like, something for tornadoes. So how Fucking did this Twister. start? The movie. Yeah, that was that was what really spiked my interest Watching in the guy fly out of yeah. that cellar trying oh, to yeah. hold the door shut and yeah. save the kids. And she... Like, that's how yeah. she got obsessed with it, right? Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's what really got me. And then um, we had a severe thunderstorm come through. I was living in Rosemount. My parents, we were at a townhome, and uh, there was a cul-de-sac, and there was a center island on the cul-de-sac. And the very tail end of the thunderstorms is usually where you would have a mesocyclone where all the winds... A mesocyclone. Yeah, and so all the winds are converging right there, and so that's where you start getting the twisting of the storm. And it it looks just literally like a circle. And from that drops your, that's like where your wall cloud is located. And that is where the tornado would drop. And there was one directly above that center island. Like right out in front of my parents' house, tornado sirens are ripping. And that really, it just, that's what sparked it for me. Yeah, it's like We've my got first bass. I caught that first bass and the rest was history. Yeah. I saw that first twister form up and I, I knew I had to see more. Yeah, yeah. So we, I've gotten some some pretty cool footage of tornadoes, and it's yeah, I absolutely love it. Like being up close. Like the the craziest one we had was Sac City, Iowa. That one was nuts. Yeah, that's where my. So what's like the is that like the, what's the biggest level? Oh, or we, most we dangerous we, level five. Is it at level category so EF5. ten? Five. EF five. So EF. it's the enhanced Fujita scale. Enhance. Yeah. Fujita. Yeah. Do you know there's a fisherman with the last name Fujita? Yeah. Cool. I don't know if they're related or not, but well, they're smart I think they're over both there. from Japan, yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, my God. I think it's Dr. Greg Fujita. You and Koyu, Koyu Fujita's yeah. lost grandfather <laughs> invented... <laughs> the Fujita scale. ...the categorization of, of twisters. Yeah, and it's all based off of damage. Well, so, the tsunamis probably... Yeah. Oh, so Hurricane... 
tornadoes, weather kind of runs off the hurricane off damage. is off of wind speed. Okay. So hurricane is off of sustained winds in the eye wall for a certain duration. Um, tornadoes, it's more so based off of the damage they inflict because of you could have a tornado that has 140 mile an hour winds. That but if hits, nobody dies, then well, it's like, nope. no, it hits a barn <laughs> and the barn is poorly constructed and it'll obliterate it. But you could have an EF5 tornado with 200 plus mile an hour winds hit that same barn and it obliterates it. So it's all based off of the structures that it hits. And so that's more representative of how powerful the winds are. So if you have, let's say, a very well-built structure that has strong anchor bolts that the house is built off of, and you have an EF5 tornado hit it, and it snaps those anchor bolts and rips apart that concrete, an EF2 is not going to do that. But if you have a, a less well-built house, the amount of damage is going to hard, be hard to tell the difference between. They call that the... Th so they use the three little pigs scale. Mm -hmm. You know the, the yeah. childhood story, three yeah. little pigs? Yeah, based yep. off how the house is built. Okay, so a level like one or two... You know, yep, blows down have, the straw houses. Yeah. The level three, if you've got a house made of sticks, that wolf's going to blow that house down. Yeah. If you've got a category five, she's Every, a brick. Yeah. House. Yeah. You need a concrete structure to survive one or a very well-built basement. Interesting. Yeah. So it's kind of, now it's philosophical. If a category five lands... In, or uh, excuse me, if a Fujita, if a Fujita five lands in the middle of a field and hits no barns, was it a Fujita five? Yeah, you don't know. You don't you know. Don't and know. so versus the hurricane, only, they yeah. know. So the only so a good example of it actually is the tornado they just had on the screen. It was an L. This podcast is brought to you by my compadre, my tournament partner, my brother. And the best rod builder above the Mason Dixon line, Veselka Fishing and Customs. Specializing in custom fishing rods. That's right. Hand built fishing rods, custom made and tailored how you want, whether it's by length, action, specific technique, balance, or anything you want. Anything. Veselka Fishing and Customs can build it. Mr. Veselka also has a wide variety of rods to choose from, which we've had a lot of fun with, perfecting and testing. The most unique and famous rod developed at Veselka Fishing and Customs is his custom Marabou hair jig rod. Have you thrown the old Canadian dinner mint? The Harry Gary? The Fighter Fly? The old Thin Lizzie? If you have, then you know these little fluff balls can be hard to cast, especially at those key sizes as light as 1 16th of an ounce. Well, what if I told you you could cast that marabou jig 30 to 50% farther than you're casting it now? What if I told you you don't have to spook those shallow, skittish smallmouth? Well, with the custom hair jig rod from Veselka Fishing and Customs, not only can you cast a lot further, but the way this rod loads up on a long cast is pure perfection. This balanced rod has the perfect backbone with a light action parabolic taper that keeps those fish pinned without breaking your line. Mr. Veselka utilizes an 8 foot custom fly fishing blank converted to a spinning rod and couples it with premium guides leading up to custom fly guides that allow maximized casting distance and reduced line friction and blank slap, maximizing your overall performance, obviously. And we found this rod is not only perfect for marabou hair jigs, but for any light bait you need to cast far, including small swim baits, spy baits, and more. Any light bait you need to cast far, look no further than the Veselka Fishing and Customs Hair Jig Special. So head on over to his website, theselkafishing.com, that's V-O-C-E-L-K-A fishing.com, and treat yourself to the custom hair jig rod or any custom rod you can dream up. Reno in 2013, um, it was, a, I think it was May 31st, 2013. It Is was that one the of, El Nino of the North, El Reno? El Reno, it's a town in Oklahoma. Oh, really? Yeah, it's west of Oklahoma City, and... This was the largest or the widest tornado on record at 2.7 miles wide. What? Yeah. 
and it was so it got you a, were there oh, i wish oh my god actually that one i wouldn't have wanted to be with because it had um it's called deviant motion where it doesn't follow the storm motion and so can i just compliment your vocabulary very quickly like <laughs> Holy shit, you have a PhD in this stuff, dude. <laughs> I'm very, just obsessed with it. Very well spoken. Yeah. It, well, Carry on. It, it doesn't travel in a straight path or a consistent path. The, so, this wide one? Yeah. And so it actually killed two prof- or four professional storm chasers. Yeah. Dr. Tim Samaris, who is one of the like the well most well-renowned. It killed your hero? Yeah, one of them. Yeah. It's insane. What does that mean for you in your future? I just need to be careful. <laughs> So, okay, how how many, like, what's the, ri- like, the death rate of being a storm chaser? How it's, it's, how dangerous it is that? It depends on how stupid you are, really, how much you like I to suppose. push it. Okay, so let's take the average IQ of a storm chaser. What's their level of death? I mean, is it, it's, uh, it's, oh, it's, as long is as it like skydiving? Yep. Where it's like one in a thousand? Like skydiving or whatever? It's very, very low. Okay. It's, it's very low, but. So you're almost more dangerous just yeah. driving without a storm than chasing one. Yeah. But that tornado, it didn't hit any well-built belt structures, so it only got rated EF3. But there's an asterisk next to it because they had a Dow truck, which is Doppler on wheels. It's like a half-semi truck with a Doppler radar mounted that they use for the University of Oklahoma research projects. And uh, they had that truck measure 295-mile-an-hour winds in it. And so that is well above EF5 scale, but since it didn't hit anything, it didn't get rated EF5. It got rated EF3. Three based little pigs of, got lucky on that based one. Based off the damage done. Interesting. Yeah. Whoa. So, okay, now now my brain's going to, like, uh, there is, could you, like, start a weather show for fishing Oh yeah, nationwide, a weather created show daily. Yeah, around the nation mm-hmm. at the major fishing destinations. Yeah, to use your weather expertise, you would have to be super, like, you'd have to have good tech. It would be really hard because there's so many factors that come into the weather. Yeah, so. dude, they're always wrong. Mm-hmm. So. Walk me through. Walk me through why a weatherman is one of few people who gets paid to be wrong. It's because everyone thinks they're wrong when it's their house that doesn't get rain, but ten miles away, the guy was right because that guy's getting rain. Ah, weather is very um, geographical. Yes, and so it's hard to get it a hundred percent on a you know, quarter mile radius. It's very easy to get it a hundred percent in a 500 mile radius. So it's all based off of pinpoint locations. Hmm. So that's, that's why everyone thinks the weatherman is wrong. It's because, okay, this one mile stretch didn't get any rain, but this 30 mile stretch got absolutely dumped on. And to those guys, the weatherman was dead on, but to you, he was off. Yeah, you're right. This fishing weather guy idea was bad. <laughs> so it's it's hard to be exact. But what's the furthest you've traveled for to watch a storm or to chase a storm? What's the furthest like you you've gone? Mm, that's a tough one. Um I think Sean and I were pretty much on the we we're on the southern Iowa border, south of Des Moines. Okay. And that's when, that's the furthest we've ever, ever gone south. But at each year, we keep getting further and further away. What's the scariest story from tor- that storm That City, Iowa tornado. Talk to me about yeah, that. Yeah, because that one um, was really powerful. It was an EF2 because it didn't hit anything. It was in the farm fields. But there's a thing called an inflow jet, which is where the inflow into the tornado was so strong that it was sucking up dirt off the ground into the tornado and i got i got some wild pictures of it but it was uh it was sucking in all this dirt and all of a sudden out of nowhere um we got hit by an inflow jet and it almost ripped us right off the dirt road and we were going like 65 on this dirt road and luckily <laughs> What's an inflow jet sorry inflow jet so 
the storm has inflow and outflow. So and, it sucks in and shoots out. Yes, and it's wrapping around the tornado like this. So the inflow is on this side, the outflow is on this side. An inflow jet is where a super powerful area of inflow forms, and it sucks off the ground into the tornado. It's almost like the tornado reaching out and pulling in. It's like a bass inhaling yeah. a spinnerbait on this side, Yep. and a bass spitting a mm -hmm. spinnerbait out on this side. Yeah, and so it was sucking it in on one side, and all of a sudden... We got hit by an inflow jet, and it almost ripped the truck off the road. So you're ripping down yeah. this dirt road. And I'm hyped. 65. And I'm hyped. And you're like, holy shit, this is awesome, man. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, whoa. Yeah. What was that? It was insane. That was close. Yeah, it was fun. I love that shit. It's an adrenaline rush. So then, <laughs> like, how close were you to the tornado at this time? Like, how far oh. is the hand of that suction? It's all based off of how large it is and how big the wind field is. But in we this were situation. probably half a mile, maybe a quarter of a mile. <laughs> so <laughs> this, <laughs> yeah, we were pretty close. Do you know, how far, like, <laughs> yeah, no, Na no, no, nature. that feels far away nature. from like a like that. Yeah, time. but when it was you're also in a, a quarter mile wide. I get that, but <laughs> you're like, I'm talking about the sheer suction power mm -hmm. of that thing look out a quarter mile away yeah. can you imagine something sucking you towards it and that's it a quarter even... to a half a mile yeah. away yeah my mind is blown it wasn't right even now. that strong one too which is insane yeah yeah how do more people not die from these well built like, structures that's why there's so much studies on tornadoes is to build homes and structures better so that people have a higher survival rate that's I think... why not as many people die in the Midwest is because we have basements. Dude, a lot of homes down south. Full don't circle have climax of this movie. Yeah. Thank your local bricklayer. Okay? <laughs> that is an underappreciated skill. Yeah. Do you know how many lives bricklayers yeah. have saved and yeah. get zero credit for it? Yeah. It's wild. It's like a yeah. Half a mile away, you're dead if you're no brick between you and that thing. Like, oh yeah. Oh, no brick layer. Oh, yeah. Bye bye. Those inflow winds were probably a hundred, a hundred and ten miles an hour. Dude, now that I think about it, I'm fucked. Yeah. In my we'd house. Be okay. Well, no, wait. We'd be. I mean, you have you'd a basement. Be first to go. I'm my house. I did. I wish we had talked two years ago about this because basements are important. <laughs> I don't have a basement. That's scary. Do you have a storm cellar? I don't have shit. <laughs> Do you know where your nearest storm cell shelter is? Nick Gross's house, my neighbor. Perfect. That's where I'm going. Yep. Good. That's your tornado plan. So, then. my risk of death if a tornado hits my house is really bad, If actually. it's EF3 or higher, yes. Okay, so I'm glad we're having this talk because you know all of the tornadoes that happen. Mm -hmm. So, you, you need... Like, if you're going to keep doing this great work for, for humanity, <laughs> you need a list of, of vulnerable speed dial folk. Oh, I do. You need to add me to that list. You because are. Because if there's an EF3, yeah. you're you going to know about a... it before anybody. You're yeah. going to know about it before me. So well, we don't like, know how strong it is until after. There's a radar. I need you to text me for EF1s hitting the Watkins oh, yeah. area. I did it for Bankston last year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. We didn't call him Panic at the Disco Bankston for nothing. <laughs> yeah. I, Bankston has a basement. Yeah. He has a basement, but he got hit by a brick. Big hailstorm. And so yeah, his they truck happen. and one of the Intune boats were outside. So that's that's important. <laughs> it is. But yeah. lot, lot living. Yeah, that's the most important. So, okay. EF1 is higher. You, it's a bad thing. Storm related wise. But now we're under the same page. So if I die... I just, mom, if you're listening to this, it's Matt's fault if I die in a tornado because he said he was going to call me. <laughs> Do you want to go storm chasing with me? Yeah. <laughs> it's actually fun. Would you go? For sure. I got like 50 pounds on you, so I'm not getting sucked into nothing. Well, we'll be in the truck, so if the, suck, if the truck gets sucked in, <laughs> we fucked up. Yeah. I fucked up. Just so you know, he did just say the whole truck, half mile. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, if it's strong enough, it can do that. 
there sucked is, uh, a two-ton truck up like a freaking Senko. Oh, yeah, one of the Joplin tornado. They have the Joplin water Joplin, tower. Missouri. Yeah, they have the Joplin water tower. It got 95% of the town got leveled. It was like a mile and three-quarter wide EF5. And like leveled to, it was just some concrete foundations even got scraped away. That's how strong it was. It threw a car, like a full-on F-150 style half ton. It threw it 300 feet in the air and dented the water tower, like a mile away from the storm. Surprised it didn't take the water tower down. It was a, the water tower was a mile away from the tornado. Oh shit! Yeah, it threw a half ton vehicle, so two thousand pound vehicle. So, Dude, go ahead. Um, when we say so, those vehicles weigh more than two thousand pounds. Well, yeah, that's just it's throwing like a 4, number 000. out there. Yeah, yeah some, it's the rating system yeah, of yeah, the vehicle. Yeah. yeah. I'm, so in, you the gotta think it's I'm actually, in the back of the classroom. It's actually like 4,000. 6,000. Yeah. yeah. Some of those vehicles are seven. Yeah. 6,500. Threw it. A, a mile. I think it was just under a mile away. Dented the 100 <laughs> foot tall water tower. I did my second grade research project on tornadoes. Mm-hmm. In second grade, my grandparents and my mom grew up in Granite Falls, Minnesota. Oh, yeah. There's a famous tornado that hit Granite Falls and leveled the place. Yep. Like, the leveled the place. The same tornado went through St. Peter. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I guess at a young age, I saw the turmoil of a tornado, and I, I was obsessed with them for, like, yeah. three, four you years after that. This off at all? But this is Dane's smallmouth small mouth tattoo. You're going to have to hold it a lot closer. A lot closer, yeah. It's a wide angle. I was going to honestly close out the show by getting up, grabbing the camera, and just Perfect. putting it by you. We'll do that. So why don't we just do that right now, now that, <laughs> now that you know. we got to keep it clean and hygienic in here. Yep. So, okay. This was really a fun a fun time, Mr. Oh, Waldron. Yeah. Catching up with you is it. always... Can you pull it out of the stand? There you go. There we go. Uh... Catching up with you is all oh, head, head, headphones, beer, headphones, beer, beer, beer. headphones. A special treat. I'm gonna take those off. I don't need them for this. Yeah. I don't need to hear. I'm gonna set that on the counter. Over Always there. a special treat, Mister Waldron. And uh, we got a little multitasking done today. And Dane, oh my God, look at that, dude. And it blends right into Tonka. Get Harbor away. Tattoo Studio, Veselka Fishing and Customs, Matt Waldron, Dane Veselka, Teal's Bass Galaxy, checking in. Oh, yeah. Checking out. 